Ah, thanks. So thanks, Shubha, for the nice introduction. Thanks to all the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I am not sure I am qualified to give this talk and I am not sure about the content of this talk because I am talking to an audience I don't know the background of at all and I am not sure I will get it right but let me try. So uh, I want to start with a caveat that this talk is going to be a hodgepodge between facts and opinions, the opinions of course being mine but I think it is impossible to stay in this field for so long and not have opinions about several things so I will mention them and you have been duly warned. So, uh, there's an outline of my talk, um, maybe we'll not worry about it right now. I'll go on to what I want to start with. So, starting with why am I, why are we interested or why should we be maybe interested in fundamental science? Because if those of you who understood Shubha's introduction of me, uh, I will like to paraphrase it as I work in the area of uh, fundamental physics or fundamental issues in physics and uh, those details were all technical details. So why are we interested in such things, of what use are they? And so I want to start by motivating, as I said there will be some facts, uh, not balance, my selection and uh, followed by certain opinions. So uh, can you see the pointer, I cannot see the pointer, uh, yeah, yeah, ah, okay, now I can, I think I didn't aim it, from. thank you. So. Uh, more than 100 years ago, the electron was discovered and that discovery was driven by simple curiosity. I mean, why did they discover the electron? Simply because it was there, right? But today I am talking to you through electronics, you can see all this paraphernalia and that would not have been possible without this original discovery, right? So this is the starting point. Fundamental science is done not to find applications, but I want to propose the fact, which is in fact I think accepted by most people, that fundamental discoveries in science leads to applications in engineering and technology. But the motivation is not to do the applications in the first place, but to understand the basic science. So let me go on to more examples. Uh, again, almost 100 years ago. Uh, okay, maybe I should have said uh, Thomson's name here because I have uh, Anderson's name over here. So the positron was discovered. So for physicists, uh, what is a positron? It's an antiparticle. So there's antimatter in the universe and the antiparticle of the electron is called the positron and it was a tremendous vindication of a certain quantum theory that was predicted by a very famous physicist called Paul Dirac of the existence of antimatter and antiparticles and it also gave a certain meaning to Einstein's very famous uh, mass energy, uh, I think this is an equation which everybody knows, I am sure all of you know this equation, yeah absolutely E equals mc squared whether you know what it means or not E is equal to mc squared, okay but it also tells you and in fact that combination of presence of antiparticles and the mass energy equivalence, someone is curious I can tell you what it is in three lines later, led to something called positron emission tomography which is called a PET scan, all of you will know it as a PET scan and it was invented as a consequence of these discoveries. So such advances in medical imaging and there are so many of them, x-rays not only for broken bones but also you know that CT scan is just a collection of x-rays, right, that's a tomography of your body with x-rays the PET scan with antiparticles, uh, MRIs, uh, uh, MRI used to be called NMRI because MRI maybe nobody knows stands for magnetic resonance imaging but actually it's a nuclear magnetic image resonance, uh, resonance imaging and the word nuclear was dropped for obvious reasons because people are afraid of the word nuclear, right? So it's called MRI now though it started out in, in life as being NMRI but all these advances in medical imaging were possible because of these initial discoveries which were simply driven by curiosity. And these examples are from physics because that's the field I work in, I know them best. I, may, I will give you another example later from a different field. Uh, there are countless such other examples even though I may not talk about all of them. But I want to talk about one specific example before I go on to some opinions rather than facts. Somebody asked this question and it's not important in what context but it was a question which was very, very um, uh, demeaning or derogatory oh, you know, what's the point of doing all this science, what's the use of Einstein's theory of relativity, after which in practically every talk that I give, which is a popular lecture, I include this slide, 
because this is the use of Einstein's theory of relativity. You all have GPS, all of you have phones, I'm sure. Not even a question to ask anymore. Uh, there are very few souls in this universe who don't have a, a cell phone. And there's GPS on most of these phones. And what is this GPS? There are some 30 plus satellites orbiting the Earth. Each of these satellites ca carries an atomic clock, which is very precise. An atomic clock is uh, a very special thing because it has a very, very fixed frequency which is known very, very precisely. So the clock is very precise. And once you turn on your location in the cell phone, of course, you know what you can do with your GPS. There are many things, probably you know more than I do what you can do with the GPS. But what is it that is required for the GPS to work correctly is actually back to Mr. Einstein. He had, apart from knowing E equal to mc squared, he had two theories of relativity. One is called special relativity. One is called general relativity. And they are both fundamentally different things. They talk about very different systems. But in short, to talk about the GPS, Einstein's theory of special relativity says that because the satellites are traveling the Earth, because they have to go, go around the Earth twice a day. That's, there's a technical reason for that. It doesn't matter. So they are traveling at something like 14,000 kilometers per hour, which is fast by any standards, right? Even by standards of a plane, this is really fast. So such objects which are traveling so fast, which means the clocks are also traveling at that speed, Special relativity says that such fast moving clocks will tick more slowly. That means time will move slower on those clocks and the correction is about 7 microseconds per day. It's a small number. Now, Einstein's general theory of relativity says that these satellites are far away from the Earth. They are about 20,000 kilometers away. They are in an orbit of radius 20,000 kilometers. They are far away from the Earth. And the further away you are from a massive body, the smaller is the gravitational force. And therefore, they experience much less gravity. And what does gravity do? Einstein says, gravity curves space and time. So when I have a massive body, I'm standing here, and space and time is curved around me because I have a mass. And Earth has a larger mass. Sun has even larger mass. Black holes have really huge masses. So perceptibility, space and time curve around such massive objects. And because of this curvature, these orbiting clocks see uh, lower gravity, lower curvature, which leads to clocks ticking faster by about 45 microseconds per day. So now you have to be Einstein, subtract these two numbers and get the number of the fact that the GPS satellite clock goes faster than a clock on the ground by about 36 microseconds per day which is a very small number until you realize that light travels really, really fast. Light travels at 300,000, sorry, I can't convert this, 3 into 10 power 8 meters per second, which is about 10 into 10 power 8 kilometers per hour, right? Meters per second to kilometers per hour is just a factor of 3.6, three times larger. So now you com convert that, that turn turns out to be a correction factor of 10 kilometers per day. Now I'm here in Nation College of Journalism and I'm hungry and I call my Swiggy guy to order my favorite whatever you want to eat at this time. Suppose the restaurant is about 30 minutes away and you don't do these relativity corrections, your GPS will make the guy deliver to my institute IMSC which is just behind you about 200 meters away and my colleague is going to eat whatever I have ordered. Right? So you see that there is a reason in everything and Einstein did not discover his theories in order to make uh, Swiggy delivery guys uh, deliver at the right place on time but it so happens that these corrections are important for such things. So uh, I again want to reiterate, uh, scientists don't sit in their ivory towers thinking of oh what, what application should I now discover. It's not that way that it happens but more or less it does happen that eventually all such uh, discoveries in science will end up having applications and the relationship between science and society happens when those applications are not good for society, right? So, everything is awesome, science is awesome, we have seen some really fantastic uh, uh, ideas and discoveries and applications of that science and so in particular I talked about physics, so physics is awesome and the question is, is it? So here is my example of Hiroshima and the nuclear bomb. Uh, the, about uh, uh, in 1998, when may, maybe most of you were not born, I think, among the students in the audience, uh, you heard Professor Shankar sitting next to him as Professor Murthy and myself uh, wrote a little booklet on uh, not just the science 
of the nuclear bombs dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also the social background uh, in which this decision was made. And I'm taking my uh, dog, uh, slide contents from there. Uh, so here is the background for those who don't remember. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. OK, this just functions differently from the machine that I have in my office. So sorry, now I figured it out. So here, with the surrender of Germany in early May 1945, that was the end of the Second World War. So Germany had already surrendered. So the European part of the World War had ended. Japan had not yet surrendered. So Japan was still at war with the US and allies. The whole focus shifted to the Pacific. And at the same time, there was a target committee which was entrusted with the task of identifying possible nuclear bomb targets. Because over the last previous four years, there had been this huge group in the United States working on uh, the construction and testing of the first atomic bombs or the first nuclear bombs. So the target committee members, uh, I think all of you have watched or should maybe have heard about the movie Oppenheimer, so I don't have to do tell you who is Oppenheimer. He was the boss of them all. So in his committee and in this particular target committee were the members, it doesn't matter who the members were, but if you look at the number names in red, so all these people were scientists. You can see the name prefix doctor on all of them, like Dr. Lauritsen, Dr. Ramsey, by the way, who went on to get the Nobel Prize in Physics, Dr. Dennison, von Neumann, who's also a very famous mathematician and physicist, uh, Stearns, uh, more about the Stearns later, uh, Robert Wilson, uh, Richard Tolman, William Penny, uh, more, uh, and of course, Oppenheimer himself. So all these people were there, and their task was to talk Ah, okay, yes, special invitee Hans Bethe, yes. And one more person, I don't remember who it was, but okay. So anyway, so what was the main agenda? It doesn't matter what the main agenda was, but I want, to, want you to look at D and E. D was status of the targets. What is the target? It's, you know, who you want to drop the nuclear bomb on, that is your target. And the psychological factors in target selection. So I want to only look at agenda item D. And according to this committee, so everything I am saying is quoted from that article which I just, by the way, um, I think my email address was there in the beginning on the slide. Anyone wants a copy of the talk, please feel free to ask. I am sure even uh, Asian College will have a copy and give it to you. So uh, the qualifications are they should be important targets in a large urban area of more than three miles in diameter. And I leave you to figure out why they wanted such a thing. Uh, they should be capable of being damaged effectively by a blast. Very effectively you must damage it. And look at the third one. I, f I find that the worst of all, they, should, they are unlikely to be attacked by next August. You want a pristine target area so that you, what you want to see is the effect of the nuclear bomb and the nuclear bomb alone. You don't want to see any other bomb or any other weaponry or any attack which you know contaminates these findings. So that is the finding or the qualification that this uh, particular target committee has mentioned. And here is the list of targets that they had. So Kyoto, uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Japan, a very beautiful old capital, uh, intellectual center for Japan. Uh, Hiroshima, which was an important army depot and adjacent hills which are likely to produce a focusing effect which would considerably increase the blast damage. Yokohama, uh, Kokura Arsenal, Niigata, and of course they also discussed and thankfully gave up the idea of bombing Emperor's Palace. Just imagine bombing one building with a nuclear bomb, I mean crazy, but still, I mean it was there in the list and it was the recommendation of those present at the meeting that the first four choices be Kyoto, Hiroshima, Yokohama and Kokura and of course the rest is history, we know what happened. Not only did they drop the bomb on Hiroshima but on Nagasaki as well and, uh, and uh, well that was that. But you see the role of scientists in this decision. The more than half the members of this committee were scientists, they have made very dispassionately the best possible requirements so that the ma maximum damage will be done and chosen the best possible target so that they will more and more damage will be done. So here is where we talk about the role of scientists and science in society. So it's clear that an independent, independent dispassionate assessment of discoveries and decisions related to science and science and technology issues cannot just be left to scientists because you can see how badly they fell down on the job. 
So it's indispensable to have a dispassionate independent assessment of such things. It was always so, always will be and it is in fact the need of the hour I think particularly in India today for various reasons as I'm sure you all know. Next, scientists cannot assume that their research has no impact or only positive impact on society. I think this is a, sorry, a talk where uh, it's not just about critical science journalism, but also I think it's important to understand among all you journalists, budding journalists, what scientists have been doing, what should have been their role and whether they have lived up to it or not. So I'm putting it out there for you to think about. So they must engage with society and here as I said journalists have a crucial role to play and one of the reasons I was very happy to give this talk here is I want to canvas among you all young people the importance of science journalism because we are living in a very technology filled world and we cannot actually close our eyes to that fact. Unfortunately scientists as again especially in India have very few or hardly any fora voices or institutions which can disseminate information offer technical inputs to governments, shape policy decisions via policy documents, etc. For example, the Department of Science and Technology, Indian Academy of Sciences, how often have you seen things put out by them talking about social issues or currently controversial issues and taking a stand for or against something? It hardly happens, right? I won't say never, but it hardly happens. This is something that I think society as a whole must push. Uh, for such, uh, such independent institutions. It's very important compare for example with the American Physical Society where their role has been to always engage with society and they have done it very successfully for a very long time and Europe has such institutions as well. And such an institution must seem to be both even handed and independent. It must have good credibility. It cannot just be saying yes sir, no sir to the government. It has to have its own credibility, its own standing, its own reputation so that when journalists go to such organizations, they will actually be believed. And this is something I think there is a huge lacuna today in India. Uh, I, I am not sure uh, whether it's uh, convenient for journalists that that is so or whether some journalists find it a problem, whichever it may be, I think uh, this is really my opinion, but I think it's also a fact. Okay. So I want to take now an example which is not coming from, well, kind of related to physics, but not directly related to physics and an issue that has impacted society. And I want to talk about uh, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan because that institution is literally next door to you and the work he has done for literally so many decades, right? Uh, I hope you know that he passed away recently and has spent uh, a huge part of his life working on, on various issues related to agriculture. And his statement always was productivity in perpetuity without associated ecological harm. However, I am not sure how many of you know that the genetics division in IARI in uh, New Delhi which was under him I think uh, till the 60s or maybe early 70s uh, was and still is renowned for research on mutagens. So what are these mutagens? So these are some agents, the physical, maybe some uh, uh, radiation or some chemical agents which will change the DNA of the organism and you, because of that will increase certain frequency of mutations of that organism and those uh, then they will select for uh, uh, the parts which have uh, certain better characteristics and uh, try to, uh, to breed those compared to the other ones. So that is uh, mutagen and Swaminathan always had an interest in that, a lifelong interest in, in such mutagenics. He also had a lifelong interest to study radiation mutations and food irradiation. So these are two different things by the way. So let me tell you, tell you a few things about them. So radiation mutation is uh, nothing but the, the way the word says radiation mutation. So we know that all every living thing uh, shows mutations and these mutations are natural because of cosmic uh, background radioactivity. When we are sitting we are washed by cosmic rays coming from outer space. Uh, one of the most important open questions in, in particle physics is what is the origin of these cosmic rays? Where are they coming from? Why do they have such high energies? We don't know the answers to these questions, but we do know that being irradiated with these natural background cosmic radiation is actually causing mutations amongst all of us, all, all plants, animals, human beings, everybody. And this rate of natural mutation, so this, this mutation causes diversity, this diversity allows certain species uh, to, to uh, survive better and some not to survive so well and by doing this in an artificial way you accelerate the whole process by increasing the radiation beyond what is the background and then you choose or select for those variations that you think are useful for you. Food irradiation on the other hand is that you just take the already produced crop 
and you radiate it to have a longer shelf life. For example, if you, if you ever go abroad in summer, you will find a lot of Indian mangoes and 100% of these mangoes, if you are in the US, by law have to be irradiated before they can be exported because they, have, they are very paranoid about uh, all the, you know, the bugs and parasites that we may export along with the mangoes. So they have to kill off those, those uh, uh, parasites and then they have to radiate them before they can export them. So these are two different things. One is actually genetically modifying the DNA. One is just uh, zapping the fruit or the vegetable so it has a longer shelf life. But both are done through radiation. So for example, groundnut is a very big thing. Uh, I, if those who are observant, if you like to buy groundnuts, you would have seen this label, uh, T, TG, TAG, TCG with a number after it are all Trombe groundnuts. They've all been produced in, in the BRC lab in, in Trombe. They've all been mutated and then filtered and this thing. And most of the groundnuts that you will get in Gujarat, Rajasthan, uh, Maharashtra will all be TG groundnuts. Okay? That, that is the thing. So, uh, Whereas in contrast, I want to show you Bt cotton, Bt brinjal as well, which the government has put on hold. But Bt cotton has been grown for many years now. Uh, and uh, it's a genetically modified plant variety that actively produces an insecticide. So they have actually incorporated a gene in this plant. And that gene is actually producing an insecticide which combats a particular uh, ball worm, which is what used to be a biggest pest for, for cotton. However, uh, there's a very nice study, there, there have been no similar studies that I can find in India. There has been a lot of resistance to Bt uh, cotton, but in China definitely if you look at the Chinese Academy of Sciences webpage, they will tell you that they have studied this for a long time and because these cotton, uh, this thing are now resistant to, to ball worm because of the Bt bacteria insecticide that it has or it generates, they actually are now susceptible to many, many other kinds of pests. And in fact, the yield has dropped because of that and that is what is, is the is a statement that is also said in India, although no one actually has done the study to prove it. But this is what everyone believes, that there has been a problem because of, of, of having this particular gene inserted in it. So these are two different contrasting, but very subtle. For people, everything is radiation, right? Oh, I'm using radiation for mutation, I'm using radiation for, for increased shelf life, I'm using radiation and I'm mutating something, I'm doing some genetic modification. But these are three very, very different examples. I think as a scientist, for me, the, they are not comparable at all. The, the relationship between the kind of insecticide uh, which is uh, uh, generated because of the gene insertion in Bt cotton has nothing to do with the kind of mutation that is done to select out varieties of, of say, groundnut or so many things. I mean, there are so many pulses, all your um, uh, moong dal, uh, arhar dal, all of them have so many of these mutated varieties which are now in the market. So, how to appreciate this difference? Because the moment you talk to general public about the word radiation or radioactivity, they will just say no. So, how to get an appreciation of the different kinds of effects of these processes on various plants, animals or whatever is a question that I think good science journalism should address. And even amongst, forget good science journals, forget common public. I think even in our science textbooks, we don't teach children these things properly. Either we say, oh, it's the greatest thing ever done. Oh, we built the Bhakran Angal Dam and that was the most fantastic thing. And then we did this and it's the most fantastic thing. Or, oh, it was all written in the Vedas. So we have no, no subtlety. We don't have any balance or perspective on what really is the debate about. Because you first put out the facts and then you start the debate. And that doesn't seem to be happening. So I think not just uh, among uh, journalists, but also among school textbooks, and I will come to that in a moment, we don't have this critical thinking. So what is it? Again, this is now my opinion. This page is actually my opinion. So science journalism requires a robust understanding of the scientific process. I want to reiterate, it's not important to know the science. As a physicist, when I read about, say, this year's Nobel Prize in biology or, or in economics, I'm not an economist or a biologist, but there should be certain way of looking at science or looking at even non-science issues in a certain scientific way in, uh, with a certain scientific approach because the science itself can always be learned. But the scientific process is something that we have to be aware of and that I think is very important to know. For example, how do drugs get approval in, in, in allopathy, allopathic medicine? There are double blind trials, right? I, I think all of you know about double blind, blind trials. So I, I mix up certain numbers and give 
the batch to person A and the person A again mixes up the numbers and gives it to the, to the patient and until the end of the trial nobody knows whether you got the placebo or whether you got the drug. And that's the only way to actually tell whether or not there is an impact of that drug on the person during the trial. Right? So these are important uh, for, for understanding the scientific process and so it's important for public to know when you say something this medicine, you take uh, paracetamol, what it does, what are its side effects, how does it work, that the information should be out there and whatever form of science it may be and I hope that the Ministry of Ayush is actually thinking of putting out certain things, all these kinds of details for whatever kind of medicine that they are promoting. So science journalism therefore should be a bridge between scientists and the general public. It should primarily inform and leave intelligent citizens. Is this an oxymoron? Leave intelligence? No, I think it's right. To join the dots and draw their own conclusions. Okay. So science journalism should be able to disregard the scientist and focus on the science. And this is an apology to Nandita, who actually has showcased the science of the scientists. But that is a very unique and very novel kind of a thing. In general, you don't want to, you want to talk about the science. Scientists come with their own baggage. You should be able to weed out the baggage, take the facts and put it out there for the public to understand. More importantly, it should be able to present in the event of a controversy both sides of the question. For example, I already talked about nuclear weapons. I think in nuclear weapons, there are no both sides of the question. I mean, my opinion is nuclear weapons should be banned, right? So there are no both sides. Nuclear power, on the other hand, is more subtle. There are arguments for and against. And a good journalist should be able to put it out there and leave people to conclude for themselves because everybody has their own opinion, their own priorities, and their own agendas. And within that, they should be able to make an informed decision. I think that is the important thing. It's okay if you disagree, but you should not disagree based on wrong information in the first place. I think that is something important. And I think that very often, uh, I don't want to criticize the journalists, but I will say this, I have seen in my own experience, very often people are afraid of the consequences and they always try to show both sides of an issue just to satisfy two people who are disagreeing with each other. And I think that sometimes lazy journalism, it might be expedient, but I think that it should not be done. But there are some issues where genuinely there are two sides of the issue. And then, of course, it becomes important to showcase both sides. Of course, all this is compounded by the fact that nowadays you have, you people are all growing up in, you people are all growing up in the age of social media. So short at attention spans, not just of children, of adults as well. I think this is a, very terrible issue. I, I feel this more and more. Every year when I teach my new batch of students, I, I see that I have to change the way I address certain, certain things and uh, that, that is really the effect of social media. On the other hand, you people have all information, you know. You pick up your phone, ask Google and Google gives you the answer. You don't have to go to musty libraries and, you know, look up old-fashioned journals. I think that there are many plus sides of social media and many negative sides as well. Finally, I want to say something. Here I've talked about, oh, critical journalism presenting both sides, this and that. But the fact is that there is a certain complexity of current scientific and technological discoveries. For example, we, we heard about climate change, right? I mean, as Shankar said, it took 200 years to figure out that climate change is real. And whatever you do, people see the thing is, I'm not afraid of a cell phone. Cell phones also radiator, by the way. So I'm not afraid of a cell phone, but many people are afraid of basic science. Oh, you know, these scientists, they sit in their ivory tower and they, you know, they are mad scientists, they're going to blow up the world. So there is this fear of science, but a, a tendency to embrace technology without understanding how it works. And I think I'm, I'm just old because this is what I feel more and more strongly as the years go by. Uh, I think this is something that you should think about, okay? So it's not easy to understand always whether when an issue comes up, uh, on the front pages of a newspaper or maybe on your news feed or whatever it is that you may use for your news, it's not easy to actually determine whether something is good or bad. I think even as a physicist, very often it becomes hard for me to tell whether some discovery is a good or bad thing. And I just want to talk about, I don't know how many of you have read this year's Nobel Prize uh, awards. In uh, 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 So the, the physics award was on the discovery of attosecond pulses in chemistry on quantum dots, in medicine on vaccine development. I shouldn't have left out economics on, on, the, uh, on women in the labor market. So as a physicist, I found it difficult to understand this particular award. So it's not easy. These things are complex. 
uh, you have to try to understand what was in the minds of people when they are trying to say something, whether they have an underlying ulterior motive or not, whether it's actually something that is good. These things have become more and more complex over time and I think that in your generation it will become even harder. So that's something that is this thing. So this is the general background of what I call critical science journalism and in this background is set my interest in, in science popularization which is uh, children. Right? As uh, Subhishi said, I have for many years edited the science magazine for, for children and the perennial question is how much do you tell them? What do you tell them? How do you say it? Right? And this is something that is there is no easy answer to, absolutely. I mean, the, apart from the obvious things about keep your sentences short, keep your paragraph short, make it clear, put a lot of boxes, put color, put pictures, that is all fine, right? But what about the content itself? And here I feel that especially in school, uh, we are really doing very badly. For example, here are some facts that children learn in school. So, uh, earth goes around the sun, sun is much bigger than the earth, we are part of the Milky Way galaxy, size of the earth, mass of the earth, all facts, everything is listed, 5th standard, 6th standard, you look at your 7th standard science textbooks, poor student mugs up, everything goes and writes it in the exam, gets 10 out of 10, doesn't learn any science, right? I mean, I think you all agree with me, right? That you are not learning anything by knowing these facts. So, how do we know all these questions? This is for me what is interesting. As a physicist, I want to ask, how do we teach them to understand all these things? Or do we just simply ask them to believe? Then you have a generation of, of children or generations of children growing up and saying, yes, we believe, it's there in the textbook, it's true, it must be true. It's in print, it must be true. Our government is saying it must be true. Right, I mean, these are all just extensions. You see how quickly you fall into that spiral. And therefore, we have to, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know whether I have the time uh, uh, to talk about this. Okay, I will leave it to you. I just wanted to give one example, Earth goes around the sun and not the other way around. Uh, this is a, please go back to Wikipedia, all of you I am sure have access. Ask about Mercury in retrograde. And you will find this beautiful video of which I have taken two snapshots, one in the middle and one in the end. See, if, if Mercury is going around the Earth or all planets are going around the Earth and sun is also going around the Earth, I will just see it going around and coming back, going around and coming back. But since Mercury is going around the sun, and the earth is also going around the sun, you see that as it goes around for a period of time which is in green, the earth will, for from the earth it will look as though Mercury is going forwards, going back, going forwards, going back. So going forwards, going back. So this is called the retrograde motion. This is one of the biggest examples that actually the earth is going around the sun. And it's not difficult to explain this without the equations to a sixth or seventh standard child, but we have never done it, okay. So each one of these is an amazing fact, an amazing discovery. How far away is the sun from the earth? What is the size of the moon? What is the composition of the moon? Except they make you believe that we actually landed in the lunar pool, which we didn't, huh, by the way. So. so, okay. So the other thing I want to talk, I think is important for children to learn about, is about serendipity. So here are the very famous example of, of Alexander Fleming. If you see an ad like this today, you will think it's a fake. But this was genuine, it was genuinely true when it was put out in, in, uh, in uh, the UK, in London uh, 100 years ago when uh, Fleming actually discovered penicillin and it was just by accident that he discovered. It's a very nice story. Again, I think Wikipedia will give you all the answers. You please go and read about them. Uh, other very nice thing I like to tell children, my daughter had a lot of difficulty tying shoelaces, she still can't do it, she's dyslexic. So Velcro is a savior for many such children, many adults as well. So here is Velcro, how did he discover it? He went walking with his dog in the Swiss Alps and all the burrs of this thorny plant were sticking to the fur of the dog and he got really irritated trying to remove these burrs, from these thorns from the dog and then in fact in the process, in the process invented Velcro which is just small hooks and a lot of uh, uh, bits of thread and the thread gets caught in the hooks and there, voila, you have a real nice tight uh, joint. So where is the joy of such science or doing such science coming through in our children's textbooks, in our science journalism, in our outreach or popularization of science for children, for adults? I think this is something that is really missing. I mean, by the time your children are in 8th, 9th, 10th, everyone is going through either IIT, JE or NEET or something like that. and. Uh, just mugging up more and more facts. I think this is something that 
a good science journalist just start a column on some nice thing in science need not be the latest discovery or the latest invention something that will fascinate children and lead them towards asking more about this is the world around us science is about the world around us and this is something that they should just you know become part of it should become natural for them to ask such questions and this is something that i don't see uh, somebody asked about mathematics so i have a quick slide on mathematics mathematics is the language of science uh, as more mathematical tools are made available research in science pro pro proceeds faster of course it's not only for science maths proceeds uh, maths discoveries proceed out of interest in maths itself but i want to take this example it's been very much in the news i think isro has been very much in the news astronomy has been very much in the news so i thought i'll take an example from here so this is the sun in the middle this is our earth you know that i just talked about gravitating objects so the sun attracts everything towards itself because of its gravity earth attracts everything towards itself because of its gravity and the l1 point is where the two gravitational forces are equal and opposite they balance there is no force out there l2 is a similar point and so the james webb space telescope which has been bringing back fantastic pictures of our universe galaxies how many of you read the news every day how many of you read the science news every day <laughs> yeah. so please if you ever go and read the science news please go and see the beautiful pictures that uh, jwst has been putting out jwst is sitting at the l2 point precisely because it needs less energy to stay there it's a stable uh, uh, lagrange point and the aditya solar probe which uh, isro has just uh, sent off into space will circle uh, uh, around uh, the l1 lagrange point and you see that there's also just uh, just not uh, uh, knowing something abstract but it also saves money to put your space probe over there and therefore it's important to know science and maths and they are also important to understand the world around us so having started talking about astronomy recently so i want to talk about tamil nadu science forum i am a member of tamil nadu for science forum for the last i don't know 35 years maybe many members of the audience are also part of tamil nadu science forum which is a part of the umbrella organization called all india people science network which puts out from time to time uh, their uh, policy decisions on various things the government is doing uh, and here is something that they talked about recently uh, ncert has released 10 uh, modules called chandrayaan utsav modules and to be very very understated they contain several errors and uh, some sample comments on the next three pages will tell you what those errors are so we have put this out i think they have had good coverage in the press uh, but uh, if you haven't seen it then here are some examples so for the secondary stage Uh, one statement that is said is chaitra month is named after chitra nakshatra transiting the moon during the period i mean apart from the english which is not so great let's not worry about that i can forgive them for that but the comments so I'm, the comments are actually the statements from the AI, aips and response to this modules which is in the public domain uh, it's a nakshatra which means constellation for those who don't know nakshatra is the background it is the moon that transits in the foreground obviously right the moon is so close to us it cannot be that the nakshatra is transiting in front of the moon so that's uh, uh, another the shape of the velodrome is like a frustum which a sliced cone is leaving its vertex like a bucket how many of you have understood this <laughs> and this is for secondary school children now now let me show you a picture now how many of you understand this oh. yes so that's what it is so you take what is a bucket what is a bucket you slice off a cone and what you are left with is a frustum and that's like a bucket but so there's a english is wrong the science is wrong the explanation is wrong so will students be able to make sense of this complicated description so there are questions on correctness comprehension but i'm going to go on there are more and it only gets worse so now this is the higher secondary stage grades 11 and 12 it says if satellite orbiting around a planet is comparable to the planet then the binary system revolves around their common very center now what does it mean a satellite orbiting around a planet is comparable to the planet comparable in what sense so the statement actually is that comparable in mass but that crucial thing is left out right so if it's comparable in mass then of course the comment of uh, that that will make it clear what they are trying to say the comment of uh, eipsn is the bodies will always revolve around their common bari center if one of the bodies is more massive than the other the bari center of the system will be closer to the larger body so here is the sun here is picture always says it all right 
So, the barycenter will be closer to the larger mass and then they will revolve around this common center of mass and that is what a barycenter means. But the whole mass word is left out, right? I mean, I'm standing in front of you and I'm saying, I'm attractive, aren't I? And then, yeah, I mean, those who want to say yes, say yes, but in what sense? They say, I am a large mass and I am attractive because of attraction of gravitational force. I mean, the two have completely different meanings, right? I mean, I'm always attractive, but what does it mean, right? <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't resist it, okay? Fine. So, here is, here is the, the worst of them all. Uh, here. As we delve deeper into this cosmic odyssey, we cannot help but be inspired by the indomitable spirit of Werner von Braun. I can already see shocked voice for faces, father of rocket science, the visionary engineer who transformed dreams of reaching the stars into tangible rockets that reached Earth's atmosphere. His towering achievements turned the boundless expanse of space into an attainable etc. etc. And with that, we conveniently whitewashed the fact that von Braun was a Nazi scientist who built missiles V1 and V2 for Hitler. It's worse than just him being a Nazi scientist. He was a member of the SS for many years. When he realized that Germany was going to lose the war, he sued for, uh, uh, he surrendered to the, to, the, to the Americans. The Americans realized that he was a fantastic rocket scientist, took him to the US, he was a member of NASA. He built up NASA, he built up the whole space exploration program of NASA and NASA found it convenient because they were in a cold war with Russia. So, how much worse can you, how, how much uh, less integrity and uh, this thing can you have and it all says that and this is the example that our great NCRT experts found. Is this being recorded? Okay. Too late. <laughs> Too late, I don't care. This is the fact, right? This is it. This is what it is. Okay, so that's it. So, these are my examples. I think I have the just last uh, some ending thoughts. As I said about science and scientists, and about journalists. So, let me start with the thoughts on science and scientists. So, science journalism can be complex because of the technical nature of the content, but it is also political and we should never forget that. As much as history or politics is political, science is a very, very political object. It is not something that you do in isolation, certainly not in today's world. Scientists have done a poor job, yes, I am a scientist myself, have done a poor job of defending their work, especially in the Indian context. Here we are far behind the West, where science popularization and science outreach among both students and general public is in a very advanced state. And I think we absolutely need to correct that. Scientists have not been able to reach out successfully either to the general public or to policy makers. So, what a, what a tremendous failure that is. We are not even able to direct the, the course of the science research that we want to do because we don't have any clout with the policy makers and we don't have any support from the public because we have never reached out to them. We're really in a pathetic state and so we have no long-term, clear long-term vision about where we want to go. And there are no easy answers. So critical thinking, very high levels of integrity, willingness to abandon promising research ideas if it proves to be in conflict with what we understand are the social problems of, of our country are very crucial aspects. So, these are, as I said, some thoughts, my opinion certainly. Now, more thoughts about science journalism. Our world, our society today has many complex science related issues. We have already heard about the state of the environment and climate change this morning. Embracing of technology, I have already talked about it with the associated fear of the basic science that is underlying it. Ethical issues in the field of medicine, etc. I mean, all of us are afraid of going to the doctors anymore, right? Uh, so, all these need information dissemination and debate. In short, they need science journalists. That's why I'm here on the podium. Exhort, even if 5 or 10 percent of you take to science journalism, I will think that I have achieved something today. The details of the science depend on the field, but the scientific approach is critical for all types of reporting, which is fact-based, evidence-based journalism. And I am very, very clear about this. Whether you want to cover uh, this year's Nobel Prize in Physics or whether you want to talk about the Gaza War, it's the same thing. Science journalists can act as a collective conscience by asking the right critical questions and holding up a mirror to scientists and to society as well. And in today's world, unfortunately, this seems to be a real challenge, but I'm very hopeful when I see the young faces in front of me that we can and we should make a change. So I will stop here. Thank you very much for your time. Insightful lecture. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. Due to time constraints, we request you to ask pointed and concise questions. While the mic is occupied, you could also write down your questions and pass them to the moderator. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. So, uh, as you mentioned in one of the slides, that how science is directly not related to the general public. Because when we know about media, that it is somehow catering to the public by generating awareness and information. So, along with the fact that they are not, science is not directly able to do for the public, don't you feel it has become more profit oriented in the recent past? The whole uh, field of science. Uh, there are two different statements over here. One is that science is not related to the general public. I thought my whole point of the lecture was to say that whatever underlies your technology is the science. And you won't be able to understand what that technology means unless you understand the nature of that science. That is statement number one. The point about profit making science, I think it is really unfortunate in India that there is so little private uh, uh, um, uh, funding of science. I, I, I would say, you know, just few percent. So, science is funded by the government. I'm funded, I work in a science institution which is funded by the government. And so, there is no money in it. I mean, I have not made my millions being in the scientific field. Uh, so, I, I think that you're asking more about technology. Yes, I mean, technology, I mean, is being driven by markets, markets and sales. There is money to be made there. The underlying science is very often not even patented, right? If you look at the World Wide Web, www, which you see on your uh, Google pages when you're doing a search, www was invented by CERN, which is an organization in Europe, in Geneva, for research in nuclear and particle physics. And they gave the discovery free to the world, right? You don't, do, you don't pay any patent when you go to a www site. You don't pay any money for it, right? It's always a free site. So, typically scientists don't patent their work. Very rarely that they do. And the money is not made by the scientists, it's made by the technologists. I'm not sure that answers your questions, but I think yes, I, if you allow me one more minute to answer this question. Uh, I had, I had a washing, I'm, I'm on my second of everything, you know, my washing machine, my, uh, my, my phone, my cell phone, my, my laptop, my, uh, my fridge. My, my, my first washing machine lasted 15 years. My first uh, laptop lasted nine. My first uh, uh, fridge lasted 35 years. So now you look, I mean, you can't even imagine a washing machine which, or, or a fridge which lasts 35 years any longer, right? So that is, that is now what the markets are doing to you. I, this whole thing of sustainability, you start RRR stands for reduce, recycle and reuse, right? We have to reduce. We don't have to buy that cell phone every year. The, 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 the manufacturers don't have to put out a new model every six months. That is where the money is being made and I'm very serious about that. That is an issue which as a collective in society we can, we can address it. I, do, I don't think individuals can address that. I'm not sure I answered your question but that's what I think. Uh, so, I, I wanted to ask how do you think one, while reporting as a science journalist, how do I keep the scientist out of the picture and work with just a science? I'm asking because there are two constraints here. One is that who is the scientist heavily skews what is the science that is done. And the second is the methodological constraint that as journalists we report based on interviews and sources um, and my sources are the people along with the manuscripts? So. Uh, it's a very good question and there is no easy answer. I think by asking more people, that's how you, you solve this problem. You, you ask more people, see, I, I think also that what I find, I mean, I have had some uh, opportunity to interact with, uh, with journalists on some issues and I find that certain journalists only go to certain sources. I think it's important to go to, I mean, if you have a certain feeling, like if you are interested in, uh, say, uh, or you believe in climate change, I think it's important to go to scientists or even to any people who have a spectrum of opinions on it. And only then you will be able to f figure out what is it that makes sense and what doesn't make sense. If you always go to a source which already agrees with your opinion, then I think you are not going to get very far. I think that is where the word critical comes in journalism. You have to simply ask and you have to be prepared with an open mind that you might actually change your mind at the end of it. See, I, I think, see, a lot of activists, for example, who I talk to, they are very, very keen to oppose. It's very easy to say, I, I oppose something, I stand here in dharna, I oppose. But to, to endorse something is very hard because there are so many nuances. And though that endorsement can only come after going through a whole set of pros and cons, right? So, that, that is where you start to, to kind of separate out and to see and to probe 
and to and to balance out and and find out but that comes from experience you, you mean as a scientist i have gone wrong so many times in my gut feeling right i think that some problem will be solved some way and it never gets solved that way so i think these are these are trial and error but the the thing is i think always data you have to get as much data as possible you have to get as many opinions as possible and that is the nature of science right i mean everyone has a stake in it that's what i want to say everyone has a stake in it everyone has a right to ask it's not some uh, exotic stuff that is being done and hidden no the whole idea is to put it out there to make it public Ma'am, first of all, your lecture was so in insightful um, Thank you. and very clear to all of us. <laughs> so I wanted to ask, um, Ma'am, you spoke that scientific process is more important to understand rather than science itself. Uh, we need this uh, lack of clarity or missing gaps when understanding scientific process. So uh, how do you think, uh, and I'm asking this because I'm unaware, like uh, what are the challenges? Uh, that has scientific journalists that we could face uh, in accessing information or like when we are trying to understand the scientific process? Uh, from what I have seen, I think your major problem is a time constraint. All journalists want their bites like yesterday, you know, so because it's a mad world, right? If you don't put it out there, there's already 10 people who have and that is a huge constraint for you. So you have a time constraint and within that you have to make up your mind. See, I, I think even though I say that you have to go in with an open mind, you are not going to take up a topic unless you are already interested or, or involved in it, right? So here is a topic that you have taken up and you have to now make a list of who are the people. I think this is something, that's where I said, I think the scientists have a role to play. We have to make it easy for you people to put out that list and say we are the experts in field A, B, C, D, which you can later dispute, but we don't even have that, right? So what happens is that, uh, for example, as I said, again going into activist mode, as a TNSF member, I am an activist, right? I can talk to anybody and anybody and you know, just say whatever I want because I am just an activist. But as I say, if I am a scientist working in that area, I have to ask, oh, will the government let me say this? Will my boss let me say this? Will I, you know, be fired for saying this? So it becomes harder. So that is the point number one. That, that is something that you have to understand. So when you talk about the science process, you have to be able to then interview a cross-section of people and before you interview people in the technical area, you have to do your homework. You have to go and as I said, you know, Google is great. Most facts are out there. It's very rare that something is so new that, you know, I mean like today's news, there was a very interesting news item which I couldn't even believe but, but very, very rarely that happens. Very often the topic is something controversial but the facts are known. So you go get your facts, then you ask the right questions, you will get the right answers. As I said, that, that, that is the process. So when you ask the same question to three, four, five people and you get different answers, already that tells you there is something in the matter, right? And then you have to, you have to correlate, although I say you have to keep the scientists out of it, but you cannot keep the scientists background out of it. Oh, the scientist works in so and so place, I mean, he or she may be constrained to say things in a certain way or he may just be lying, right? Scientists are human and we can see from the NCRT <laughs> stuff that they are very, very human. <laughs> So I think, I think it, is a, it is a process, that is why I call it a process. But it is possible actually to go through and then you should be able to go back and ask the person more. And I, I think it's also important to build up a set of contacts where you can, you know, be passed on from person to person saying that, okay, because I, I mean, I'm, I, might, I might call myself a scientist, but I'm not really a scientist, right? I'm a physicist working in a very narrow area of physics. And I may not know the rest of the stuff, so I should be able to pass you on. And that is where I think it's important to build up this. And I think it's important for scientists to understand this and for journalists also to understand this, so that we should be able to do a better job than we are doing today. One last question. Um, hello, ma'am. Uh, Hi. Ma'am, you, you talked about NCRT in recent years, and it has come under a lot of flack for, first of all, removing the evolution last year, and this year it has been the periodic table. But at the same time, they are also adding new modules where they are adding mythological aspects to the fact that, you know, the, when you talked about the Chandrayaan module, first of all, there is a lot of wrong information in there in the first place, but at the same time, they are uh, adding mythological stuff from years back. So is the problem with the NCRT right now, is the fact that are there wrong people who are making the decisions or is there some other issue in play? What can I say? Uh, ask, ask me to bend. Ask me to bend. Say please. Please? Huh? I, I didn't understand you. Just tell me to bend. Say please bend. <laughs> um.
<laughs> Just say please bend. How hard can bend. I think you got my answer. I have no more to say. I cannot. I'm just sad. I'm really sad. But that's, that's the state of affairs in India. And I think that is why I think we need journalists, right? To carry this information. It's not easy, by the way. Huh? I mean, you can only so critical of the government. You could be a lot more critical of the government earlier. Now it's harder and harder. So. I'm going to retire soon. So it's easier for me. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is very hard. It is becoming harder. And I think that that is why I think it is important for us to, to be able to say that, you know, call this a spade and say that this is simply not done. If you remember some, uh, I think uh, five years ago or something, 2017 or 18, uh, in the uh, Indian Science Congress, which is usually held in January, there were all these statements about uh, Ganesha being the first plastic surgery, and and there was a huge uh, uh, protest. And I think you know then things quietened down. So I think if you protest publicly and loudly enough, then things will change. But you have to, you have to be vigilant, constant vigilance, right? <laughs> Um, so that was a very interesting talk, Indu. Thank you very much for this brilliant presentation. And uh, next we have three speakers. Nandita Jairaj, who is an in independent science journalist and author. Since 2012, she has been writing, editing, and creating various kinds of science media that have appeared in publications such as the Hindu, Scroll, Wire, and Mongabe India. Mongabe India. Along with Ashima Dogra, she co-founded the feminist science media platform, The Life of Science, in 2016. She is also an author or co-author of books such as Anna's Extraordinary Adventures with Weather, Ratna and the Ring of Fire, 31 Fantastic Adventures in Science, and most recently, Lab Hopping, A Journey to Find Women's, India's Women in Science. I think the book is available here, you can look at it. It's a marvelous piece of work. Uh, I invite Nandita to come and give her presentation. Okay. Got it. Uh, hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here because also I uh, went to ACJ. 12 years back, sounds like a long time, but uh, so it's extra special to be back here. And uh, this is also quite different uh, from the talks that I usually give where I'm invited to a lot of scientific institutes to talk about the gender gap, to talk about our work um, uh, and our findings. And But here I get this uh, unusual opportunity to talk about the process itself, like the journalism, the, the, uh, what it was like to cover this work, so uh, rather than what is the work itself. So that, that is, um, uh, I, I'm excited to do that because it, in a way it makes a lot more sense for me to talk about what it was like doing what I do rather than speak to a room full of scientists telling them about problems in science. Uh, so uh, I, I, um, it's not a very long presentation, but I will uh, start off with this brief background of uh, what I'm, where I'm coming from. So late in 2015, uh, my friend and my, colleague, my then colleague, Ashima Dogra, the three, uh, two of us uh, found ourselves abruptly out of a job. And like uh, many of us end up doing, we decided that, okay, we'd freelance for a while. Uh, till something more promising works out. Uh, and uh, as it uh, so happened, we, I mean, we knew we worked well together and we had some ideas we felt strongly about. So we thought we'd uh, also, you know, start some, uh, this new project together. And 
Uh, the idea was simple. It was to uh, start visiting laboratories uh, around us to report on the science being done there. And uh, for me, that would primarily include Kerala and Karnataka because those were the places that I frequented. And um, fortunately, Ashima was just about to start off on this uh, road trip from Bangalore to Kalimpong, which is in uh, West Bengal. So she had a, a much wider net uh, to cast. Uh, and. Um, yeah, this is just a very old picture of us uh, during a, one of our early crowdfunding videos where we had this political map and we were trying to pitch people to contribute so that we could go to those places. Uh, yeah, I didn't know the screen would be so big or I think I wouldn't have <laughs> put this <laughs> picture. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so both Ashima and I had had some scientific scientific training, but uh, we'd never really been in academia, so we didn't uh, come into this knowing uh, which were the good labs or, you know, who are the star scientists that, that you want to go and interview. And this cluelessness and this um, uh, lack of knowledge for the lay of the land and the who's who in science, we didn't really uh, care about this. And in fact, it came to our advantage because it enabled us to be more... Um, uh, it enabled us to be uh, more neutral in a sense and it, it protected us from this trap of becoming subconsciously um, uh, attem uh, subconsciously attempting to judge, you know, okay, this place is doing good science, this is where we should go, this person is making news, this is the person we should talk to. So we didn't fall into uh, any of these traps, at least uh, we, we tried not to. And um, because... Our goal was crystal clear for us because we knew that uh, Indian science is still largely publicly funded and there are tens of thousands of laboratories all over the country scattered in places that you wouldn't think science was happening. And every year there are thousands of uh, science PhDs coming out and, and the assumption is that they're all doing something a little novel. So what is, you know, what is being, what is going on in these? Uh, uh, laboratories, what are they all doing? And um, even things like, what do these labs look like? Are they these sanitized, cutting edge spa spaces? Or, uh, and like, who's doing the science? What are, their, what are their lives like? So these were the questions that we wanted to ask. Uh, and, and we knew that for honest answers, we had to be as random as possible in our selection of where to go. Uh, because as journalists, our, our job was not to present the best version of something, right? So you want, you want the most um, honest, the most uh, uh, real version of something that you want to present. And um, so, as, so what we found out, you know, after a few months of doing this, was that our, most of our science is not being done in fancy labs, in fancy organizations by charismatic uh, scientists. Most are being done by dusty, uh, in dus dusty government labs and underfunded university departments. That is predominantly where uh, our Indian science is being done and Indian scientists are working in these kinds of places. And the places, and the people doing the science uh, don't ready, don't come ready made with you know this confidence and the social capital, the the uh, uh, training in big laboratories abroad and inspirational stories of you know watching the stars when they're when they were children and becoming to want become wanting to become a uh, scientist. Not everybody, I mean most most people didn't have that story. Most of the people we met were just regular people, people who, you know, we'd probably pass in a, uh, in a bus stop or come across in a, in a consulting room of a doctor or find waiting outside a school to pick up their kids. Of course, they were very likely brilliant and they had been since their childhood, but it's just that most Indian scientists haven't had the opportunity or the exposure to develop the level of um, charisma that we see in in popular culture and um, and most haven't had most don't have the luxury of being this harebrained single minded scientific genius which is also so glorified uh, in in our minds and in popular culture 
So just talking about popular culture, I just uh, picked some uh, recent depictions of scientists in Indian in Indian um, uh, media. I, I don't know if any of you can guess. Some of them are easy. Sorry? Mission Mangal, yeah. Any of the others? Sorry? Vaccine Wars, Kalapani, there's one left, which everybody knows, but you may not guess because it's not a scene that, it's just there for two seconds. It's a Shah Rukh Khan movie. Pathan. Yeah. <laughs> it's Pathan. <laughs> so, um, anyway. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so these were the uh, stories that we we encountered. This was a reality that we encountered when we chose to visit these more. I mean, not this. What I was talking about earlier, when we chose to visit the more more uh, unlikely places where uh, science was being done. And uh, just to give you some uh, examples, uh, we met an arachnologist. Uh, at a college in Aluwa in Kerala, who was on a mission to spot the seven species of this uh, spider called the Certophora spider. Spy uh, yeah, it's a group of spiders. Uh, a young computer engineer from a village in Bihar who had moved to Hassan to work at the ISRO, work at ISRO's mission control center there. In Kalimpong, we met a horticulturist, horticulturalist and her much more uh, experienced lab assistant who was uh, they were basically waging a war against this virus that was destroying a lot of the local fruits in the area. Uh, a biophysicist very nearby at CLRI who was a leather expert and would consult on you know, uh, problematic leather shipments that were reaching even places like Mark, Marks and Spencers and many other places that we know. A veterinarian, veterinarian in Banaras who was in charge of the sheep and dairy farm uh, in her campus, uh, just this. I mean, this is Prajakta, uh, who we met in Mumbai. She's a pharmaceutical scientist. Uh, this is Rachel at CCMB, who's showing off her um, mini DNA sequencer called a Minayan. Uh, this is uh, Shreya in TIFR, who's showing us her mouse brains. She's a PhD student. Aruna, who is at uh, university, a geneticist at University of Delhi. Um, these are just some of the places we went to. Um, yeah, that was the orange place in Kalimpong. This is in Banaras Hindu University. And this was actually something that I never wrote about, but when I was looking for pictures, I found it. And I remember that I once went to Melkote, where there is this um, so-called science place with this uh, where these, there are these people who are basically looking at scriptures and they had this whole room full of the Pushpak Vimana and <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. Anyway, so um, probably the one thing I should have mentioned by now but maybe is uh, pretty obvious and I don't need to is that there was one limitation that we placed on ourselves that we went specifically looking for women scientists. Uh, this was because of certain experiences that Ashma and I had while we were in our workplace together, which I won't delve into too much, but uh, we have written about it uh, in a little bit of detail in our book, Lab Hopping, which you may have found seen copies of outside, so you're welcome to browse through or get a copy if you want. Uh, so uh, just now to the second part of my presentation. So we started this project, by the way, uh, we called it lab hopping because we were, uh, in a sense, hopping through labs. And uh, so we started it sort of like a science communication exercise. We wanted to write about the science that was happening in an engaging uh, uh, and, and relevant way. But we quickly realized that the interviews that we were doing were giving us far more than that. The experiences of these women that we were speaking to were speaking, uh, were really uh, speaking volumes about the gender gap that continues to persist in Indian science today. Uh, for close to uh, a decade now, actually almost around 40% of our science PhDs have been 
women. So that doesn't sound like a big gap. But the drop comes, when it comes to working scientists, only 10 to 14% of scientists in most institutes are women. Sometimes it's even lesser than that. And this is uh, what really sets the Indian uh, Indian science's gender gap apart from the rest of the world. In other countries like the US, you must have come across a lot of organizations and initiatives um, which are aimed at, you know, pushing school girls to do science, like girls who code and uh, basically fighting the stereotype that girls hate science and maths and uh, girls like pink and boys like blue. So that, that uh, narrative is really strong there. It's not so much so in India. Of course, there's no doubt that we do need to improve access to uh, education and science for girls and also for boys from marginalized groups and people of all genders. But we also need to, fo we also, we often don't focus enough on this 40% of PhDs, which are, uh, you know, they've got their PhDs, but they're not able to get their jobs as much as the, um, cis men among them are able to. So why is this happening? Is something that's still mysterious and not focused on enough. Uh, so in a sense, the women that we spoke to, the ones who were doing science in these laboratories had survived the odds in some way. But listening to their life stories really told us a lot because we got to hear about many instances in their life where they were in a precarious position where they could, may have stopped because of some reason or the other. And uh, we also spoke to many young, young women researchers who are still doing their PhDs or were working as research uh, assistants or associates or lab technicians. And many of these people were also at the stage where uh, this drop happens. So their stories were extremely valuable to understand what is going on and uh, what's the problem here. The, um, so, so through this body of experiences, I mean, over the, uh, about six years, we interviewed more than 200 uh, people and we understood that, and it's not, we were not the first ones to say this, but we were convinced that it's not just societal expectations that are setting women back. It's not just that, you know, the pressure on girls to marry and have kids. And also, it's not um, all, it's not, uh, it's not just the women who are being set back, and it's not all women who are being set back equally. The, uh, the reality that discrimination exists and discrimination is pushing people out really came through in many of our conversations. And uh, this discrimination, no doubt, is directed more at women than men, but it is also directed more at some women than other women. There are many intersections at play here. Caste is a big one. And uh, people, people from marginalized castes, uh, uh, disabled people, people who are not, not cisgender are often affected much worse than uh, upper caste cis men and sometimes even upper caste cis women. Uh, so we did hear some concrete examples, quite a few concrete examples of various kinds of discrimination from uh, people that we interviewed. Uh, these are just some of them. But it was still, uh, since, since I've been called to ask about doing this work, I also wanted to share that not everybody is willing to speak about this. And I think uh, uh, Indu also sort of uh, alluded to the pressure, um, the pressure uh, that scientists and sometimes even journalists face to uh, not talk about some things. The science community in India, I have found, is extremely dismissive or shy to speak about issues in the real world. Some exceptions are there in this audience, but I'm speaking more generally. Uh, sexism, casteism, big no-no, no one wants to talk about it. There's a lot of pressure on uh, people who are within the science ecosystem to propagate this belief that, sure, these issues exist outside but they don't seep into these hallowed hallways. Inside the lab, it's only merit that has gotten you here. So science has no gender, science is apolitical. All of these uh, thoughts are very much still prevalent. And um, since the ecosystem is still dominated by those with the most privilege, 
uh, this idea, this idea that science is, uh, has no gender, science is apolitical, has been very firmly cemented over the decades. And those who dare suggest otherwise are ridiculed and sometimes even penalized. So that, uh, that explained to us why uh, a lot of the time uh, scientists didn't want to talk about these issues. Uh, as journalists, yeah, yeah, I just have one minute more. As journalists, we were seen as outsiders, so I think the pressure was a little bit lesser on us, and we were able to ask a lot of these uh, questions, which, like, you know, revolving sexual harassment reservation, which would be otherwise taboo. But uh, at the same time, there is still a lack of critical science journalism uh, that is uh, happening here. A lot of science journalists who come from science end up doing a sanitized version of science, version of science journalism, but I, I think that more uh, you know, uh, non-science people also need to come to science journalism to make it more critical. Uh, very quickly, before I end, I just want to say that uh, lab hopping, everything we've done, uh, it wasn't just Ashma and I who uncovered these stories. We worked with dozens of writers, illustrators, podcasters, journalists. Uh, Shaintan, who's here, has also been a big part of our project. Uh, and I also want to quickly alert you to the book, Lab Hopping, which is outside there, authored by Ashima and me, story of the gender gap through the lens of experiences of women and other marginalized people who work in science. Uh, the book does not sell itself, so please take a look. Uh, if you can't buy it, take a free um, uh, bookmark at least and tell whoever you think would be interested in it. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Nandita, for that very nice exposition of your work. Uh, I've seen them start, start off with this project and uh, what she described as being jobless, being pushing them towards this thing eventually was a real thing that I've seen grow uh, right under my nose and it's, a real, it's been a really wonderful experience. The next person to speak will be Shaintan Datta. Shaintan Datta is a faculty at the Center of Writing and Pedagogy Kriya University and an independent science journalist, writer, and communicator. Their research and writing are at the intersection of science, gender, sexuality, caste, and health, and have been supported by grants from National Association for Science Writers USA, the Transforming Education for Sustainable Futures Project, and the Reframe Institute of Art and Expression. They have been listed as one of the 20 trailblazing queer individuals in the country by Ego Monk and their children's book, The Plant Whisperer, was mentioned in the Parag Honor List 2023. I'll leave the floor to you, Shainthar. Okay, um, am I audible? Yeah, thank you. That was a very, very um, overdone introduction that I wrote, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, but yes, um, I come from the Center for Writing and Pedagogy, uh, Kriya University. Uh, and if you'd like to follow me on any of the platforms, which is important to me, um, my, my IDs are out there. Um, yeah, and like Shubhashree mentioned, I'll be talking about caste, gender, and science journalism. Um, by the way, uh, many thanks for this invitation. It's a great opportunity to meet Nandita once again. Uh, like she said, we've been working on this project for quite some time. But yeah, um, so Professor Indumati started us off by thinking about what is it um, that critical science journalism should do, and one of the things that she spoke of was um, the task of science journalists as independent evaluators of the science through the lens of the scientific process. <clears throat> and Nandita, of course, <coughs> sorry, is, is this better? Yeah. Okay. So Nandita uh, told us how to report on science while reporting stories of its people, particularly people whose stories are not heard. Um, I specialize in, or at least I've focused on looking at 
Science is a process that is conducted within institutions. Um, and what I'll be doing is really looking at some of these institutions. And by institutions, I mean physical institutions like the IITs, IISCs, the ISERs, et cetera. And, but also um, social institutions like caste and gender in which um, you know, science also happens simply because it's a process that's conducted by people in society. Uh, so yeah, I'll be talking about this in three parts. And the first part is representation. And some, you've, you've heard some of this, but this is the most recent data that we have from Ankur Paliwal's report in The Nature uh, magazine, where what we see is if you were to look at, um, just, just give me a second to figure this out. Yes, so if you were to look at nationwide figures of undergrad students in STEM, what you see is that the percentage proportion of total expressed as percentage goes down as we move from the general category to OBC, Dalit, and Adivasi categories. Uh, what is also interesting is that never in none of uh, any of these academic hierarchies, be it as an undergrad STEM student, a PhD student, an assistant professor, an associate professor, or a professor, um, never is this government reservation quota met in the institutions where these RTIs were filed. Is, is that clear to everyone? You can let me know if you need me to explain it again. It's all right. OK. Um, it's not just a question of people being hired or people getting into these institutions, but science is a very resource-heavy discipline. What that means is that it requires money to happen. And if you were to look at the grants that people have received, either in terms of um, their, their fellowship for postdoctoral research or as a development and transfer division grants, um, two details that Paliwal could pull out, we again see that only 0.7 and 0.4% of these grants um, have, I mean, people who have successfully won the grants are from Adivasi backgrounds. Um, Dalit and OBC people continue to be underrepresented. And, um, well, the general category is heavily overrepresented in both these processes. So in some sense, what we're saying is that there's a structural and infrastructural way in which discrimination that Nandita was talking about works. It works by not letting people into these institutions. And for those people who are in these institutions, it works by not giving them the adequate resources to do their work. Uh, this also applies to gender, of course. So this is from Bias Watch India. Um, Shruti Murlidhar and Vaishnavi Anantanarayanan have been running this project where they've been documenting the base rates of the number of women faculty, uh, women in research, science research in science institutions in India. And they've recently put out their data as a preprint. And what we see is that of all the institutions that they've looked at, only 17% of faculty members are women, um, the highest being in 23% in biology, followed by 17% in mathematics. And if you were to look at disciplines like engineering, which are typically thought of as masculine disciplines, you know, boys should be engineers, et cetera, um, it's less than 10% of faculty are women. So there's a severe crisis um, in some sense of representation that we are looking at. Uh, this is the top eight institutions which we have in the NIRF ranking. And if you look at the NIRF ranking, top, ten, top eight institutions, um, all of them, the representation of women is less, less than 17%, which is the median base rate for all institutions in the country. And in fact, for some institutions like IISC, IIT Madras, IIT Kharagpur, we are looking at base rates that are less than 10%. Right? It's really abysmal numbers. These are numbers, if you were to actually think about the fact that the number of women who have taken up science disciplines in school has consistently increased. We know that these numbers are very, very abysmal. OK, um, we, of course, caste and gender are not two independent categories in that sense. Um, these categories blend into each other and influence each other. And this is not something that we have very recent data for, but what we do have uh, is 2010 data from Anita Kurup and others um, study based in the Indian Academy of Sciences and the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. 
uh, where what we see is if you were to look at the caste distribution of women in research, and the way they define women in research is people who have uh, assistant professor job and above, what we see is that, um, so yeah, they did a total of about uh, slightly more than 250 um, people, they responded to their survey, and most of them are general category people. Um, in fact, at the time when they had made their report public, this was actually a zero. Um, and the 3D representation makes it slightly difficult to visualize it, but, the, but we're literally looking at how zero looks on a bar chart um, there. Great. Uh, so what I'm going to now talk about is, I mean, you know, this as a question of institutions and cultures and structures, as I promised in the beginning. Um, and I'm going to draw a little bit from my own reporting and a little bit from work that my reporting has drawn from. Um, okay, so this is a heavily abstracted diagram of the IIT Bombay campus. Um, it doesn't matter how the actual campus looks as long as we all agree that it's a broadly L-shaped campus. And in this broadly L-shaped campus, you have this one region, which is where all students' hostels are present. Right? Pretty much all students' hostels are present here, barring one. There's only one hostel that doesn't find its place in this hostel block. Uh, and it's called Hostel 10. In the 1970s, it used to be called the Ladies' Hostel. Um, after protest from the women occupants of that hostel, um, it's been now called Students' Hostel 10, which houses most women on campus except the married, married women who are housed in the Married Scholars Hostel. This hostel has a very interesting history. One is that the director's bungalow used to be right opposite to it. Um, everyone knows why you want to put women right under the gaze of the director. But also, the other interesting history is that over the years, while IIT Bombay has actually built more hostels to accommodate men on campus, this is one hostel that has undergone demolition and rebuilding, demolition and rebuilding in the same plot of land in order to really accommodate all the new women students who've come into the IIT. What that means is that this hostel has less than six meter square area allotted for each student, which is less than any other student hostel on campus. Um, all that means, and this is from Chainika Shah and Chinmay Shidhore's book, Space Segregation Discrimination, all that means is that um, there is a way in which infrastructures, material realities of science institutions are changed and oriented in order to continue perpetuating certain discriminations. Um, and this is one of the arguments that I made in a piece that I wrote in a column that I run in The Wire, which um, that star is for the Ladley Media Award this year, and that story won the award, which, for which I'm grateful. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, I moved too fast. Okay. Um, like I said, infrastructure segregation, you see that, um, and something that's been in the news a lot these days, is uh, the segregation of messes in IIT Bombay as vegetarian and non-vegetarian messes. Um, and at least um, for, for some of us who've been following the issue, what we do understand is that caste has played a very central role in how vegetarian and vegetarianism is constructed. Um, and I'll, I'll show you in a while, um, Rennie Thomas, who's an anthropologist in science who works on science institutions, has also spoken about how vegetarianism is constructed as a more scientific food choice, although there is no real scientific evidence for that, etc. So what I'm saying is that these infrastructures are gendered, these infrastructures are casted, and these infrastructures um, perpetuate discriminations. The material reality of institutions in which science occurs has oriented itself, has developed to perpetuate these uh, discriminations. Um, the other way, um, and, and other than the infrastructure itself, the other way in which um, casteism particularly is perpetuated, and perhaps um, sexism as well, is um, by toying around with processes that have been put in place. So all of you perhaps know about the reservation policy uh, that all government institutions are mandated to follow. Um, it's capped at about 50% and combines various axes of marginalization, including caste, 
And then there are horizontal reservations that are applicable to people with disabilities, et cetera, right? Um, one of the reports that we did as a part of the lifeofscience.com, which Nandita is also a part of, um, is we actually um, spoke to one faculty at IIT Madras who had resigned alleging, uh, toying around, uh, kind of fudging, sophisticated, covert sub, uh, subversion of the affirmative action process in IIT Madras through the special recruitment drive. And some of the things that came out in this report were things like um, very, very narrow, or advertisements for very, very narrow disciplines that only very few people would have expertise for, um, things like um, changing the age of application, changing the kind of requirements that people have, so that knowing that um, only very few people from very elite institutions would have degrees or specializations in those fields, which would automatically eliminate people coming from marginalized caste backgrounds. Um, and this is something, I mean, we are not the first people to have spoken about this. There are several reports that tell us how processes are subverted in order to perpetuate casteism, including how, for PhD students particularly, uh, we see how people score very high um, in, the, in the entrance examinations, but when they go to the interviews, they score very little marks, and that's how the reservation quotas are never met. Um, uh, so yeah, I was talking about this paper, it's an interesting paper, it's also very accessible, so if all of you are interested in looking at how science occurs in institutions, you can choose to read it. It's called Brahmins as Scientists and Science, and as Brahmins calling caste in an Indian Scientific Research Institute. This is an ethnography of the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, it's one of the most prestigious science institutions in the country. Um, so this is what one of Rennie Thomas's interviewees said when asked about, uh, you know, what do they think about caste um, in, in, um, in terms, as, as a scientist. So the person said, these guys, and I'll leave you to decide who these guys are, not interested to waste time like us. They think it is better to go for a technical or business education so that they would get immediate benefit. Science and research will not have an immediate effect. It takes time to get benefits. The most important thing one ought to have while pursuing research is patience, which we don't find among these groups. Um, so needless to say, I'm sure you've identified some of the easier offensive, easier to identify offensive statements um, in that quote, but also the idea of pursuing research as something that requires patience and the fact that certain groups do not have that patience and therefore should be excluded from science is one of the ways in which caste makes itself visible and actionable in an Indian science institution. The other thing, um, another quote uh, from a different and apparently allegedly, so these are all anonymized so I don't know who they are, but allegedly a very, very famous scientist in IISC. I'm reluctant to enforce affirmative action. An affirmative action basically means reservation. It's a placeholder for reservation. At a very high level, like PhD. I'm not for it, actually. I don't think it is required. I think affirmative action and reservation should be there, actually, up to 12th standard. Maybe you can include college, medicine, or engineering. After graduation, at the post-graduation level, I don't think it is required. For higher studies, one requires interest. It is important to get good people who are interested in research. The researchers should be passionate, so we should be very careful about it, and one must be sure about it, otherwise it can destroy the system. It looks like getting in people from marginalized castes, marginalized genders, is seen as a threat to the system of science itself. And I'm not saying that this man is necessarily misguided, the point is what is this system of science then, which is so fragile that it can be broken down by more inclusion. Right? Um, and then the question of interest and passion as placeholders for what is called merit. And merit, again, we have a very, very strong theoretical argument, empirical argument around how merit is an obfuscation, um, very, very poorly defined. We do not understand what constitutes merit at all, but something that is deployed often to keep certain people out of these institutions. Um, and then finally, um, does anybody remember this case? Has anybody heard of it? Okay, yeah, so this is something that happened in IIT Kharagpur where there were these classes that were happening uh, for people who came from marginalized caste backgrounds and people with disabilities. Um, these were what's called a, a special 
a class for people who have missed the cutoff by just a little bit. They go through this course, and then if they are able to pass, they are offered seats in the institution. Um, videos resurfaced, and Vaishali Khandekar and Shalini Mahadev have written for the life of science, saying that the resurfacing of these videos is the only novelty here. The fact that a Savarna woman teacher is standing and telling a class full of people um, coming from marginalized backgrounds in a course meant for students who come from marginalized backgrounds that they do not belong in class. And that me saying things like, um, are you in school bloody bastards? And sorry for the profanity, but it's not mine. Um, you cannot do anything to me. These cultures of impunity and these cultures of abuse are what keep caste running in Indian science institutions. Uh, finally, I want to spend a little bit of time, and I'll close in another two minutes, um, regarding how gender and caste particularly shape scientific knowledge. You can think about this as a, as, as a, as a window into how any kind of social position, social location, social access shapes scientific knowledge. I'll be drawing from two disciplines that are slightly bet more in my area of expertise. One is neuroscience. My training is in neurosciences. neurosciences and the other is HIV AIDS, which is something that I report a lot on as somebody who looks at health. Um, OK, so let me start with HIV, because that's one of my recent reports. Um, so one of the things that people have looked at um, when you think about HIV uh, is who is the high at-risk population, right? Um, all our HIV intervention programs from the government are geared towards identification and intervention into the lives of people living with HIV who are at a high risk of either uh, transmitting HIV or people who are not living with HIV but are at a high risk of uh, getting HIV, getting, getting HIV. Um, and when we think of HIV risk, um, does anybody know what categories of people fall into HIV risk? You can throw some words at me fast. I have two minutes, it seems. Okay, so the word that the Indian government uses is MSM and TG, so men having sex with men and transgenders. Uh, what else? Sorry? Yeah, so injecting drug users, IDUs. Female sex workers, FSWs. There's one more. Okay, yeah, so that has come, I mean, it's at least not one of the high-risk populations. Drug yes, truck drivers and migrant laborers, right? Fantastic. The point is these populations are seen as populations that are at a high risk of HIV, and they have been constructed as people who need condoms all the goddamn time because they are either having too much sex or they are just unable to maintain um, the requisite level of safe sex practices when having this much sex. Um, the way gender com complicates this question of HIV is uh, by in one way pointing out that HIV risk is a biologically shaped. So for instance, women are often said to be at a higher risk of HIV because um, there's a higher risk of vaginal tears during sexual intercourse as compared to tears on the penis but also uh, the fact that many STDs are known to be uh, asymptomatic in women. But then there are also things like social and cultural factors. The fact that women do not often have the autonomy to negotiate safe sex. Women often do not have the autonomy to reach out to doctors without the presence of their husbands and in-laws. The fact that women, um, when they go to doctors talking about their problems, they are often uh, dismissed entirely simply because they are seen as people who are making a big fuss of things that are not fussy. So the point then is um, the, the, the task of science journalism is to really put these two risks together and to demonstrate that what is constructed as a body at a high risk of HIV is not just at a higher risk because of its biology, but also at a higher risk because of the social and cultural factors um, that govern what the body can and cannot do in society. Uh, of course, very popular question, are male and female brains different? Uh, do we know the answer to this? What do you think? Hi, are you all sleeping? Please don't sleep. 
I promise to treat all of you to a coffee if you answer this question. Huh? Okay, let's, okay, I'm hearing social conditioning, a faint yes. Ah. Okay, I hear some no's and, sorry? I, I, I didn't hear that. All right, scientists can't agree. It looks like a question that is yet to be entirely answered. All right, um, the truth somewhere lies at the intersection of all of this. And as a journalist, you're already familiar with this idea that if you have 10 sources who are saying 10 different things, the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? So, well, um, this is where the idea that men and women's brains are perhaps different starts. It starts with this old hag of a man called Paul Broca. Um, you know, just like, um, a, a scientist just comes after Vic Queen Victoria's era, like the Victorian England, and for some so, and he finds these skulls, right? And he measures the areas of the skulls, and he says, "Oh, okay, um, looks like these skulls belong to women. They are smaller in size, and these skulls belong to men, and they are um, larger in size." And of course, scientists think of the implications of their work. Scientists just don't report findings. That's for us to do. Um, what he said that, oh, the female brain is of course reflective of not just the fact that women are slightly shorter than men, but they're intellectually inferior. I mean, of course, they do all the domestic work. How can women not be intellectually inferior? Um, so intellectual inferiority, physical inferiority, both are terms that are deployed to say that the small brain in women is a reflection of their inability to be equal to men. And this is where the idea of these two brains as separate begins. Um, what is interesting is you are right in saying that scientists cannot agree on whether the male and female brain have fundamental differences. What we do understand that the size is indeed fundamentally different in the sense that you can run different normalizations. You can normalize the brain to body size, you can normalize the brain to the size of other organs. What we do find is that the brain size seems to be for some reason different and yet other than that, there are very, very few differences, and even for size, we have no idea what it means. At least in terms of tests, be it intelligence tests, be it for other tests, we have found no difference. Scientists have found no difference uh, in terms of uh, what the human brain can do uh, in, in between male and female brains. And what is sad is that this is an understanding that comes to us just in the past decade. This is not something that has been revealed to us uh, much earlier as it should have been. Um, what is important is that we have also seen um, a change now, given that this critique has come up. Uh, science seems to be readjusting. So in 2021, we have a, a, a lab, in, this is probably in Harvard Medical School, Barbara Sahakia, who tells us, who, who gives us an alternative frame of looking at the human brain. She says that all brains are androgynous. They have some properties, what you would call typically male properties, and some properties, what you would call typically female properties. Um, and I'm saying call because there's no way for us to say that this is a male property. But cultures construct something as male and something as female. All brains have a combination of these properties. Um, and then what you are looking um, when you're plotting the brain on a line is not to say that here's the male and here's the female brain, but here's a more androgynous and a less androgynous brain. And that's a, that's a reframing. And then we have even more interesting um, models that have come up. This is from Daphna Joel's lab, who's in Israel right now, somewhere in Israel, I don't know, um, which is the human brain mosaic where Daphna Joel says that every, um, so if you, so she provides us a framework of about 16 things that you can ask a person to, in order to map their brain mosaic, and every brain uh, will show for each of those 16 um, points or characteristics a different location in the male brain, female spectrum. So what you would then have is this very complex, and we heard a lot about complex systems and complexity in the first half of the day, a very complex picture of the brain, where in terms of some properties, it shows a more male location, or in terms of some properties, it shows a more female uh, location. 
Um, so finally, I have just two things um, that I want to tell this audience, especially the students. So one is that, um, how is it that you arrive at conclusions like this? The one way that you do it is that when you report on a finding as a science journalist, it's critical that you look at its historical and social context. So if a scientist is saying that I have found a fundamental difference between uh, you know, male and female brains, it's critical that you go back and look at how they are historicizing their data, who are they, where are they coming from? So it's very, very critical that you look at who the scientist is and in what traditions are they located in order to arrive at these critiques. And the second is you must strive to represent a diverse pool of sources. And I think this is something that we all agree on and uh, in the Professor Indimati also mentioned in a while back. Uh, finally, here's a potential question that I'll leave all of you with. And if any student here wants to take it up as a story, I'd be happy to help which is, uh, we've been talking a lot about, um, at least Professor Indumati very importantly, also mentioned about the question of public trust in science in India. Um, and given the fact that marginalized groups are a part of this public, and marginalized groups have been systematically eliminated from the scientific ecosystem, so then the question is, how does this tense relationship affect who the public is, and how do they trust science in India? With that, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Shantan, for that uh, very thought-provoking talk. And, uh, and the marginalization of uh, marginalized communities being in higher institutions like IITs doesn't really end with students. It also persists in the faculty when, when they become faculty and so on, I think. There was this famous case of Subramaniam Sadirla, who was in IIT Kanpur, which was a very tragic uh, situation. Um, we'll have room for questions after the tea break. Before that, we will have a talk by Narmada Devi, who's a postgraduate in electronic media from the Department of Media Sciences, College of Engineering, Gindi. She has been working in media and development sector organizations from 2003 onwards. She's a person who has uh, been interested in science communication and works in content for children. She has been on the editorial board of, editorial team of Pattam, a student's edition from Dinamalar group, and has curated volumes of science content for ch school children. She's uh, now with, uh, she, she's now working as an archivist in Karuvulam, a digital archives initiative of the Tamil Nadu State Committee of the Communist Party of India Marxist. She continues her work on science communication and journalism as a freelancer. She will be speaking to us on covering uh, science for the regional language media, Tamil in particularly. So I invite her to come and present her talk. So very good evening. I'm happy to meet you all here and you know, speak about this very important subject, doing science journalism in Indian languages, especially in Tamil language, uh, because regional language, uh, yeah, we will come to that uh, term regional language a little later. So basically, uh, before g getting into this uh, topic, I just wanted to, you know, mention about this famous quote of uh, Carl Sagan, which I really like. We've arranged a society based on science and technology in which nobody understands anything about science and technology. And this compatible mixture of ignorance and power sooner or later is going to blow up on our faces. See, I'm blowing up. Uh, so who is running the science and technology in a democracy if the people don't know anything about it. So I think I don't have to take time in explaining this. This speaks, you know, the importance of science communication, science journalism in the language which the common people, the marginalized sections of the society, the working people, the underprivileged section uh, can understand. So in that, in their language, uh, you know, what is happening, what is the driving uh, factor of the society, which is the science that has to be conveyed to them in a language which they uh, can understand. So that is very important. 
So, so can you just uh, orient me on how yes, to use this? Yes. Yes. This pointer. Oh, okay. So the term regional media, uh, I'm not using this because all the um, uh, 22 languages scheduled in the Indian Constitution, they deserve to be, uh, you know, regarded as national language. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so they all deserve to be regarded as national language, uh, including Hindi, all the languages are spoken at the regional level. So Indian language media, specifically Tamil media, or even language media, I mean, it's being, uh, uh, you know, referred to as, as language media. Even for that matter, English language is also a language media, right? So, uh, so let's use the term Indian language media. And specifically, uh, since I have uh, experience uh, working in uh, Tamil print medium, and have covered uh, signs uh, for children, not for adults, uh, but for children I've written mostly. So my focus would be on uh, the scope, limitations, the specific distinct challenges while communicating science, while doing science journalism in Tamil print medium. So I'll be uh, speaking on all these aspects. So the focus would be print media mainly, and to an extent, uh, we will have, you know, few uh, points. Uh, we will be covering few points in the electronic media, the visual uh, uh, media, basically television, uh, the news channels, how they cover, and uh, because electronic media has got a great scope because of the, um, you know, motion graphics. Uh, yeah, and there are certain challenges in science journalism which are common to uh, both English as well as non-English. And, uh, but there are specific distinct challenges which I mentioned. Uh, so our focus will be understanding the scope, challenges, and what needs to be done to improve science journalism in Tamil media. Uh, so, yeah, this will actually convey the sad state of science journalism in uh, English media in a developed uh, country like United States. Uh, Columbia Journalism Review, which is a media do <laughs> Why? Yeah. This is a media watchdog, am I audible? Yeah. Initiative of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. We graduate, uh, you know, a school of journalism started by Joseph Pulitzer in the year 1912. It's an oldest school of journalism. So they have this, you know, uh, review initiative. And they have published this uh, information. In the site, you can see this. In 1989, there were 95 weekly science sections in the American newspapers, which got reduced down to 34 in 2005. And in 2012, they got further reduced to 19 weekly uh, sections. If this is the state of uh, science journalism in a developed country like the United States, imagine a country um, our country with 1.3 uh, billion population, you know, people speaking, um, you know, uh, many different languages, uh, 22 scheduled languages. Uh, what is being done uh, to cover science through the media? And even if there is, you know, enough science journalism done, are the people able to? Access media, that itself is a big question because a lot of factors like caste, region, uh, you know, accessibility to technology, all this comes into play, class, gender, uh, can women, um, you know, focus um, uh, on the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, um, current affairs, like what men do, so a lot of factors which come into the play. So. But science journalism in Indian language media is extremely important <coughs> because uh, the people who cannot understand English, people who can only speak and uh, who can communicate in their own language, they constitute the majority. But there's very little space given to science journalism in the Indian language media. Sorry, I'm just going to have some water because I have this reflex issue after lunch. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, just before coming to this uh, session, I just had conversations uh, with my friends uh, who work in various media organizations. Uh, I spoke to my friend, a close friend of mine working for the Dinamani. He is also from science background. He was a science forum volunteer. He works for Dinamani. And uh, Hindu Tamil Desai. And I spoke to uh, my you know, editor uh, who is in charge of the Dinamalar main sections science uh, column. Uh, so I spoke to three people because I yeah. I just came to know what is the current status. Do they have a weekly uh, section? Dinamani doesn't have any weekly section as such. Uh, but in the 90s when uh, Airavada Mahadevan was the chief of bureau, uh, they had uh, Arvial Mani, which covered, uh, in which was a weekly section that covered science, but uh, uh, they s soon stopped it. They don't have it any longer. But important events are covered as news items. Chandrayaan, uh, they covered as news items. And uh, I was just asking, how do you, uh, you know, ensure accuracy because you don't have uh, any uh, dedicated practice of doing it. So how do you manage accuracy? They said, nowadays uh, the sites, um, especially institutions, give precise content. So it is verifiable. If you don't have that capacity, we are, I mean, the local um, experts, the writers, the science writers are very much accessible. So we just uh, get the content run by them for accuracy. Uh, but uh, they don't have any weekly s uh, section as such. And Hindu Tamil Desai, they had a section called Ara Mariva. I don't know why they <laughs> termed it as Ara Mariva, Sixth Sense, uh, that was uh, uh, covering science. But after COVID, uh, that was a casualty. Um, uh, because most uh, uh, newspaper organizations do that. Even um, uh, Dinamalar had a Monday edition. Uh, Dinamalar, in the sense, you know, Chennai, uh, Coimbatore, and Pondicherry editions, they had uh, this weekly supplement, man, uh, Pattam, which covered, uh, in Pattam's content, one third of the content is science, and that way at least something was going on. Con stories about uh, the mathematic developments in the mathematics uh, world were also fe featured. So uh, during COVID, all this, you know, supplements uh, were the casualty. So, so they stopped that. But uh, uh, as far as I have uh, seen from Hindu Tamil Desai, though there is no weekly section as such, they, come out, they cover a good amount of uh, good, really good science articles. Uh, I've seen many uh, um, resources contributing uh, or using that space uh, for the sake of science popularization, be it Dr. TV Venkatesh, many, uh, you know, doctors, uh, you know, medical uh, professionals use that space to take uh, the vital information to the public, so that is always there. So I would say they're doing a good job. And they also have the career guidance and uh, children's supplement, which uh, feature regular stories on science. Plus they also have uh, uh, pages, um, you know, sections for environment. So Dinamalar has, um, I'm not covering about Pattam here because that is exclusively a student's edition. I am focusing on the main edition here. Uh, earlier, they had a dedicated space for it, which was done, which was basically outsourced. But after they had this Pattam initiative, since they had a team who can uh, handle science, they have a half a page weekly section now. And the focus is primarily on applied research, you know, diabetes, um, uh, you know, so diabetes or it could be cancer treatments, obesity. So if there's anything happening on the applied research part, mostly to do with health, that's what they cover because they feel, you know, people shouldn't be alienated. Uh, so uh, there is a perception that basic science research are for children, school level. So they're not handling much. This is the inference I made. This is not, though this is not the statement which the person made, I, I could infer. <clears throat> and other important initiatives in print which I wanted to mention, uh, though strictly not from, you know, a media institution, monthly magazine Thulir, uh, it's been continuously published by Tamil Nadu Science Forum volunteers since 1987. Huh? Correct. I'm a Thulir kid. I started reading uh, Thulir uh, back in the days uh, when, you know, 92, 93. And I would say, if I'm able to sustain my interest in science, even after doing um, you know, so much of political activism these days, I always you know, look 
cannot avoid science. It's because of the uh, sustained interest inculcated by Tulir when I was a kid. I would proudly say that. Yeah. And uh, so, and Dinatandi, that is the widely circulated uh, newspaper. I mean, uh, people who don't have a formal literacy can actually, uh, you know, read Dinatandi paper. My mother-in-law, who has not even gone to school, not even done her, uh, you know, first standard uh, level of education, she can, in the Eritu you know, uh, uh, she can read syllable by, syllable by syllable and she can finish that entire newspaper. So the... And these newspapers also play a role, right, in taking information to the public, but they don't give in, uh, importance to science. Uh, because, again, you know, this perception that science will alienate uh, the general readers from the public, uh, sorry, um, uh, alienate the newspaper content, overall content from the public, that comes into play. So, uh, why, uh, so, so out of the four, uh, I, can, I can say it's like, 30 to 40 uh, percent importance is given. Uh, so even that is not, that's still a little place, right? Or uh, no space in terms of uh, uh, newspapers that don't commit space for science. So why, there is a myth that uh, science cannot be understood by common pe people. Is it so? People cannot understand science. Yeah, that's a myth. So when people are provided science content in a palatable, imbibable, connectable manner, there is a huge reception because human beings have always had this curiosity. Uh, how do I, you know, originate? Uh, how do humans as such originate? And how, you know, um, planets, uh, the stars, the suns, and how did they all uh, come into place. So this innate question, curiosity of humans is always there and uh, that can be rewarded through good science journalism. If good science journalism, not just science journalism, good science journalism is not done, then the entire humanities will be affected because there will be anti-vaccination mindset, there will be anti-science mindset, there will be environment fundamentalism mindset which will take a huge toll on all of us. So yeah. Best example to bust the myth that people cannot uh, understand uh, uh, science is the recent example. This is in the visual media, BBC Tamil uh, news story, which is on Chandrayan. Obviously, Chandrayan is a very uh, hooking subject, but uh, look at the way. Chandrayan moonin tik tik nimidangal. What will happen when it lands on the surface of moon, lunar surface. Chandrayaan titatin thala yudutte in the padinayindhi nimidangalil daan. See, interesting way of writing. This is not sensationalism. Uh, you know, the fate of that mission is that, la, I mean, 15 minutes, crucial 15 minutes. Step by step explained. So they also explained and used English. Nothing wrong. So this is a, an explainer video which Dr. TV Venkateshwaran did for BBC Tamil, which, uh, look at the views, one million. And uh, this is a bit, uh, this is a lecture actually, posted without even editing. Generally it is said two minutes is the attention span. <laughs> I wouldn't, if the content is given in such a hooking manner, it can go on. So this is one example, I don't know if this will work out. So, Chandrayan A to Z, na Maria the Tahaval Gal. So that conveys all. Uh, so there is no, you know, Tamil language purity. It doesn't, you know, hold there. Um, 1.1 million views, and believe it or not, it is a lecture given by Dr. TVV in E Road Book Fair. Uh, so it was just recorded and put up, one hour lecture, and it went on well. So, so you know, innate curiosity of humans can be rewarded to, through good journalism. See how children are uh, watching in their locality, how curiously, you know, one small cell phone with that videos. So. These two actually went viral. How do I go back? This one? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Time. Five minutes, yes. <coughs> so there's a general perception that science journalism in Indian language media is tough. So we are actually entering the crucial part, which are the challenges. Uh, 
basically this is uh, uh, this perception is there which is uh, true to an extent because much of the uh, science content are produced only in english language which the journalist uh, you know the practicing journalist would find it difficult to understand so that there is always that challenge and proficiency in english language is uh, uh, a requirement to understand subject which sets a limitation and even if the press releases, uh, even if there are press releases, process, you know, um, um, manuals uh, for uh, journalists to understand, they're all made out in English. I mean, specific attention is not given that it has to be done in the Indian languages. Uh, you know that uh, AI, um, All India People's Science Network, uh, statement which Dr. Indumati was referring, it's a beautiful work done. I actually referred it to a couple of my friends in the Tamil media. They were interested in having it, but they did not have the resources to translate. But uh, I uh, am not too sure. So because of lack of you know, resources to translate, vital things get missed out in regional media. This is something which the institutions have to focus. And uh, yeah. My own experience, I actually studied the basic science subjects only till my high secondary level. I did my UG and PG in electronic media in Anna University. I don't have any specialization in STEM subjects. The joy of uh, knowing, learning, which is to do with unlearning and relearning, and getting excited when I come to know something new, and passing that excitement, sharing. I get a lot of happiness, so that is my drive. And I always, you know, uh, got in touch with experts to get that accuracy part, uh, no, uh, you know, without any compromise. Uh, a Pi, Pi Mathematics Association Dr. Sivraman helped me to understand mathematics and even do a good job in terms of covering mathematics. So this is a coverage I did. This is an outreach initiative by Math Science Institute that was actually for... Uh, uh, the corporation school children. So they, they had scientists interacting with uh, the corporation uh, school kids. So I covered that. Uh, so I have a, a satisfaction that I've done you know, good job in terms of uh, doing you know, good coverages, good articles, but I've also failed at times. I will also come to that story. Shubha, if you can give me two more minutes extra. Yeah. Yeah, the basic challenges are translation, and uh, you know the doubt whether we can go for transliteration of terms, and there is always an expectation that there has to be some Indianness, Indian connect, regional connect uh, in any story that we do on science. But that is not uh, something which can which can be guaranteed all the time. So there will be disappointment. So in the treatment part, when we simplify uh, the language, uh, you know, to make sure that it is not given in a complex manner, then uh, accuracy could be affected. So there's always this conflict between simplifying language and accuracy, you know, ensuring accuracy, which, the, which we have to be really particular. And uh, the verification at the preprint stage, you know, checking out with uh, the resources if we had done it correctly, that's not generally entertained by the editorial. So in the treatment part, especially this happens with the, the uh, electronic media, I have certain examples to be cited. Pseudoscience, being carried away with pseudoscience, not even realizing uh, that, and sensationalism. This is, these are the challenges that intervene in the uh, uh, treatment part. Uh, I'll just uh, cite one example, uh, sorry, two uh, case, uh, cases to explain how, uh, you know, how translation of terms can be overcome. Uh, for example, how to translate the term parametrized complexity. I came across this. Uh, parametrized complexity is a specialized domain in mathematics that combines theoretical computer science. Uh, Dr. Shakit Saurabh of uh, Math Science Institute is a Patna uh, 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 He is uh, actually, he was conferred that award in the year 2021 for making fundamental contributions to the area of parametrized complexity. Uh, I tried to actually translate this word, and I couldn't do it. So I went by parametrized complexity, transliteration. So there, we need not have ego. But Tamil, uh, because uh, even since the colonial days, good amount of work has been done in translating Tamil terms, 
you know. A certain uh, words have even uh, um, come into the common usage, like Sirini Ragam refers kidney, and you know, electromagnetic induction, Min Gandha Thundudal, you know, these words uh, are uh, quite common uh, among the school students. Even the general public have assimilated certain, uh, you know, translated things. So, but in spite of that, higher level science subjects are a challenge uh, to uh, be covered in regional language, I'm sorry, in, in Tamil language. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, yeah, because this is an interview which I did with him, obviously you have to speak about what that particular branch of science uh, is right to children. So, but he explained it really well, so my, and uh, which made my job very easy. Well, the algorithms that we develop work, I'm just giving the translation, this is the text, uh, Tamil text. I don't think we'll have the time to go, that, uh, go through that. Uh, so this is a statement. Will the algorithms that we develop work, will they work with good speed? What are the parameters we fix for speed to approach all these and prove that the algorithm will work in this manner? We need mathematics. We call this area as theoretical mathematical science. I work and research in this domain. So look at how the scientist who has got a very prestigious award in his domain for his work, how, he's, how passionately he explains that to his, um, you know, to people when asked. So that statement is enough. I don't have to know much uh, about parameterized complexity. So that can be communicated fairly. Uh, so, you know, breaking that, uh, you know, challenge of uh, complexity is done. And uh, one more story, this is again the impact um, project of uh, Arjit, Dr. Arjit Samal. Uh, Samal. Uh, during COVID, they, are, they actually have a database which is called IMPACT, which contains uh, 14,000 um, uh, plants. The, it lists the phytochemicals in those medicinal plants that will be potential drug candidates. So during COVID, what they did is they actually went, uh, analyzed those 14,000 plus plants and found out that uh, certain plants had certain uh, phytochemicals that would, uh, you know, uh, inhibit uh, the enzymes that will, in, uh, what do you say, uh, give room for the virus protein to propagate. So this is the subject which I had to cover. And uh, you know, uh, I had to translate these plants, Strobilanthus, Cusia, you know, the, 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 the first line that has the names of, uh, bot botanical names of uh, the six plants. So I can't, you know, just mention in the article that uh, these names. So I had to find what the regional, uh, how they are, uh, you know, named the regional, uh, called the regional level. So I had to consult with the Siddha uh, Ayurveda uh, practitioners. But we found that they're all plants in the Himalayan habitat. So <laughs> they don't, um, you know, uh, they don't belong to this region. So Siddha practitioners couldn't help with the name. So we had to simply accept that we couldn't, we don't have the names because the plant don't belong to this land. So, but this was a partially, uh, uh, what do you say? This is not a success story. So challenges like this will also be there. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Again, Math Science Institute, they had Atish Dabolka speak about uh, Ramanujan's partition theory, how Ramanujan's partition theory was reflecting in a black hole particle emission phenomenon. That was a fantastic session which I could uh, you know, enjoy. And I was very happy about knowing further details and all that. I did a story and my editorial, um, uh, my editor said, it's written such a complex manner. <laughs> I know you have put in very, uh, so much of hard work, but this cannot be uh, carried for children, certainly. Now when I go back and read the article, I realize, oh, I must have done a good job, but I couldn't. But anyway, these things also happen. So uh, if, if you're so uh, particular that uh, you will, uh, you cannot simplify it and you want to give everything you understand, then that doesn't work out in the Indian language part. So, 
as i said verification at the uh, pre print stage helps really um but in in general uh, the editorials will not permit the journalist to get it uh, verified by the resource experts even if they are willing to uh, offer help so in that case somehow we have to find ways uh, to get it uh, done so i always do this so to ensure accuracy yeah yes so these are some of the challenges uh, which uh, uh, i have faced and uh, i hope um, when scientific institutions uh, work with journalists a good amount of change uh, can be done there could be amendments done and uh, uh, based on which a good job on good science journalism in the indian languages can be done so this is something which we have to keep in mind thank you and that was the i thought you said there were 40% of women who've done phd's uh, out of the total is that is that what you said uh 40% of, of the, the yearly PH, science PhDs are, are, women, are women, close to 40%. So have you, have you actually studied where they end up going after that? I mean, you did mention that they are not right. going into jobs in that proportion. And, and so I was curious to know whether you'd followed up that number with where they're actually do, going, what they're doing, so that we understand what happens. Uh, so, we yeah. we get the closest clues i think we get to that is uh, there's this yearly survey called the all india students higher education aishe survey and they give really comprehensive numbers though it's a bit of a headache to uh, pass from that but then uh, if uh, I, i guess it's not you can't directly say it but then you do see that the phd numbers are so much and then the number of uh women in uh state universities public universities institutes of national importance you can compare those numbers and you say that uh you see that the highest percentage are in state universities and then central universities uh, private universities are also much higher institutes of national importance are uh lower so among the um 40% who end up in this average of 14% of working scientists most of them are going to the universities and least of them in INIs but what is happening to the gap between the 40% and 14% is a bit more harder to quantify because that means you have to go and find the women who uh, i mean you have to go and speak to them and find out there is one study that came from NIAS and uh, i see anita kurup and rohini goodbole were involved in that study and they uh, included women who have uh, uh, dropped out so that is quite revealing uh, i i don't know if they say much about what they're doing now but at least their reasons for dropping out are quite illuminating if uh, i don't know if i should get into that now yeah 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 i mean uh, if if you do end up getting my book we have a chapter called the teacher scientists of india so that actually says that a lot of these women end up as teacher scientists which gives very less place for research unfortunately but a, a disproportionate number of them end up teaching some of them get into science communication <laughs> <laughs> Next question, would you like to? Yes. Um, first, I would just like to uh, ask the audience to give another round of applause for all of you and your excellent <laughs> presentation. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, I really enjoyed thoroughly your, uh, your educating us and um, sharing um, your scholarship, your research, um, and really what seems to be passionate to all of you. Uh, my question is for you. I wanted to ask, um, first off, excellent presentation. Um, I was really blown away by just seeing the disparity of uh, women uh, representation in the institutions of which you mentioned uh, in the presentation, as well as uh, blown away by the, the perfect question that you left the audience with towards the end. Um, because it makes me think about not just India, but outside of India, and how this is 
the same question, you can replicate it to so many other places in so many other countries, including the country in which I'm from, um, the United States of America. And so I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think it will take uh, to help to lower the, the, the tense relationship, right, between those who are marginalized and the scientific community, uh, and even spreading on even into looking at um, doctors and physicians and how um, marginalized communities, not just in India, even in the United States of America and other countries, um, have an apprehension, uh, a reluctancy to uh, trust um, information that is coming out of those spaces and spheres and domains, um, as well as maybe apprehension to even join that community or even consider um, looking at some of the science uh, disciplines. Um, really interested to hear your response to that. Um, anyone else who would like to respond also to that? And what would you like to see the United States do um, to help um, with many of these challenges uh, here? I ask this question as a diplomat of the United States of America and to see how with strengthening the, the relationship between the United States and India um, with our bilateral relations, how we can help to address some of the, as some people have put it, shortcomings um, that exist, how we can work together to, to, to improve on matters here and also how we can be improving um, matters for ourselves. Thank you. Uh, am I out? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I'll take a crack at answering those questions. They are all um, questions that, uh, you know, several people are working on and are, are trying to comment on. <clears throat> so I don't want to sort of uh, give one answer um, and be a be all end all answer to that. Uh, but for the first uh, question, which is what can be done to, in some sense to resolve this tension, I think. <clears throat> So what we've, we've seen, and, and this is in some sense historically true for any marginalized community, that uh, it's the marginalized community that has to come and advocate for itself in spaces where it feels marginalized, right? So if scientists are ignoring, let's say, the risks um, of an HIV infection that emerge from the social and political location <clears throat> of certain groups of people, it's they who have to come and do that. Um, so one way in which institutions can address this is by opening those spaces up, right? So, I mean, how do you have, let's say, transgender people come into an elite science institution and speak about what is it that they expect of science? I don't think we've had that kind of conversation in this country yet. Um, the other important thing um, is, uh, uh, anecdotally, several people uh, have not been choosing science. I mean, it's actually a far more complex argument. Um, we've heard two sides of the story, at least in my reporting. Many queer people say that they would prefer to study science because it's seen as something that's not governed by your identity, which means even if you're queer, you should be able to do science without um, yeah, facing any kind of discrimination, at least as a scientist. Um, and on the other hand, we've also heard people not want to do science because the curriculum, for instance, in biology classrooms is very queerphobic. Cultures in institutions are very queerphobic. So there's an imagination rift here, right? So, um, there's a, there are desires of the marginalized and then there are cultures which are not meeting those desires. Um, and in some sense, we need policy and cultural transformation to bridge that. Uh, I, I don't know how to do that. It's slightly harder for me to give points. Yeah. 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 I have a point I'd like to make in this context. Um, very often uh, it's seen by privileged uh, community, people coming from privileged backgrounds that reservation or affirmative action is a sign that you're recruiting someone from a, a, a lower strata in some sense, intellectually or something like that you know, which is simply not true. The reservation or affirmative action is there to prevent uh, people from hogging those seats that are meant to be for open competition. So there's, there should be a promotion of awareness among people that reservation is not something for, uh, to bring in people of inferior quality or something like that. But it, I mean, I'm, I'm using some very unparliamentary language here, but. I think you will take it in the right spirit. So that is, we need a lot of awareness uh, promoted among 
the general public on these matters, I think. Just one point to that. So, I mean, we, the U.S. has been seeing, um, to my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, some very interesting movements in the past five, half a decade or so, which includes the if several states have now been including caste as a protected category, <coughs> which is great. Uh, we've also been seeing uh, a very increased visibility of trans people in the United States, while at the same time we are also seeing a rise in queer and homophobic and transphobic violences. So it would be good to see some crosstalk. So for instance, what has it taken to convince the states that caste needs to be a protected category for the diaspora in the US? Um, so the mentality that can convince people who are not Indians about caste being something that requires protected category status, what does it, can that conversation also come into the country? Because here for some reason all our spaces are occupied by people who are Brahmins, Savarnas, and it's very hard to convince them that we need reservations. So it looks like some messaging from the U.S. might help us. Uh, but of course, what I, I must bolster the fact that um, Professor Indumati has been making is that the U.S. has had a very strong history of public trust in science surveys, science communication, science popularization um, that's driven by science funding bodies. And we'd like to see some of that also probably, you know, at least some models that we can perhaps modify and implement in India. We, we don't have anything like that. Yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Sorry I took up too much time. More questions, please? Yes. Murti? Can I see who else wanted to ask questions? Yeah. I think they've got the mic, so. Uh, good evening, ma'am. My question is for uh, Nandita, ma'am. Uh, so, ma'am, you were just uh, showing the stereotypes which are still linked to women while pursuing PhD, while doing the research-based work. So, uh, how do you think that... So, ma'am, you please tell me like, how do you think the whole thing can be... It can be uh, better... My, my. So... Oh. So ma'am, I would just like to know how do you think the whole scenario can be changed uh, in terms of the fact that when there is casual sexism, there is misogyny related to women when they are working and even if they want to give their best, there will be these sort of obstructions. So do you really think these things can be changed and how it can be changed so that women can work more comfortably? In, like in spite of being ambitious, many a time they are not able to give their best because the situations are not conducive enough. Um, it's a difficult question because I, you know, I mean, I can I can sit here and say, of course, it's possible, and we just need to speak up and fight. But when when we are in such positions, it's not so easy. I, one personal example I can think of is when uh, Ashima, who's a co-author, and I, we were at our workspace together and something very common, you know, it's probably still one of the more privileged kind of sexism to encounter, but the usual corporate HR Women's Day, they, uh, they um, had this very strange and sexist way of celebrating Women's Day by which we got these handbags with some lipstick print on it and uh, we were given samosas separately in one table of the canteen. Um, and so we were all kind of rankled by this, but I thought that, you know, okay, it's not such a big deal, it's uh, whatever, you know, we just whisper and l let it go, it's not the worst thing to happen and nothing can change. But I remember a Ashima actually wrote an email to the HR and uh, saying that, you know, this is, uh, it's really stupid that we're still doing this at this day and age and there are many more meaningful ways if we have to celebrate this day, there are more uh, meaningful ways we can do it. And uh, and it wasn't, she received a very patronizing reply saying, I, I don't remember what exactly, but something to the spirit of, you know, calm down and take things in the right spirit. Uh, so, of course, nothing happened in that sense, but I did notice that when people in our team got to know of it, it was quite a few very young women on the team, 
and when they heard that she had spoken out you know they there was a sort of feeling of solidarity they would never have done this themselves but at least then they got this idea that okay our feeling that this was wrong is validated that you know it is uh, if you're feeling that something is wrong if you're feeling that you're being discriminated you're not imagining it so even if sometimes things that you do to uh, speak out don't work out i think maybe the second time the third time it will empower other people to speak and at some point it might uh, it might work uh, yeah that's just one personal example that came to mind i, I feel like maybe narmada shubha shantan if you have any other so this is the case i would say in every domain uh, you know which we are Uh, we know which we cannot really compromise uh, so everywhere when there is any discrimination uh, in based on gender or uh, you know on ba based on any other identity we have to be very you know um, straight uh, forward in conveying that so i think that is a good practice which uh, ashima <laughs> did yeah Yeah, I was surprised very recently when someone opened a door for me. Actually, <laughs> it these things happen. Uh, I mean, uh, so uh, office. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> literal, 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 being very literal here. Yeah, so. yeah sometimes you just laugh it off i guess i i don't know when but some things cannot be you can when someone may it makes obviously disparaging remarks or condescending talk you do have to give it back i guess can i add one more point if i have yes. some given time yeah uh yeah shantan actually mentioned about you know uh, the disparities in iit uh, campus right in terms of naming the college and all that uh, i studied in the cg campus so block 1 used to be the first uh, uh, hostel block of the cg uh, institution as such that's the oldest block that was actually allocated for uh, uh, you know housing the women students um, even the married women uh, had separate quarters and nowadays uh, very recently i went to college i was shocked to see that uh, science journalism specialization <laughs> course which my department had was not there and i was also shocked to see the names given to the hostel blocks malligai uh, mullai these are the hostel names blocks for uh, uh, you know the blocks which uh, uh, accommodate women students they are given you know names of flowers so that is something which is ridiculous but uh, i'm now an i you know outsider i just mentioned it uh, to the wardens and the deans but i don't know how far they are taking it seriously so this is always there feminization uh, what do you say palina padutidal and the madri that is always there yeah i think also the thing is when we call these things out the there is a sense of don't antagonize you know like maybe the person is actually relatively somebody who generally supports who's broad minded who supports uh, uh, women and other groups who has like opened the door for you or who has uh, said something sexist but then we don't say anything because we feel like we don't want to lose this ally i i feel like that is a big problem especially when it comes to uh, a lot of people for example who identify as feminists display casteist behavior and then when you call them out it's like why are you you know uh, beating up your own team a lot of such uh, uh, messaging is there and I, i i feel like that sort of delicate fragility is really doing if if our movements have sort of hit a standstill it's because we need to be a little more tough we need to be accountable when people might call people uh, I, i have got called out in the past for things but you have to just 
take it you know it doesn't mean that oh like now uh, shubha has said that all the men who open doors for us are bad and like uh, that mean you know i mean we have to be open to these discussions and like beat a <laughs> <laughs> no that's true the, but it does destroy the spontaneity of your response when you're all the time conscious of uh, these things that you you cannot be yourself but then i guess we have to live with the fact that there are people who are much more uh, constrained than we are sometimes you know there's always in india you can always find someone below you to in that strata i mean of suffering uh yeah murti had a question right small uh, comment when you showed the statistics uh, you know the, the graphic depiction of uh, all the discrimination uh, in iits and other institutions in certain categories there is one more serious problem which is statistical in the sense that the catchment area itself has become small by the time you reach enrollment in iits at assistant professor and professor level the numbers available themselves are small and that is a even a deeper problem isn't it because it goes all the way back to education from the lowest level onwards so i think uh, there are and discrimination is one aspect and the other thing is you know how from very basic education from primary high school level you know the, the numbers are needed you, know, you have to increase the numbers there also i think this is one of one of the problems I, increasing I the catchment area on that you build in this discrimination it becomes a double whammy there right um so are, are you saying that there are certain disciplines which do not attract enough students not like that okay uh, no, basically uh, opportunities may not exist for many of these uh, categories to uh, to enter into these uh, fields in science and engineering from where you are trying to catch uh, you know yeah see i'm i'm from iit madras and uh, have been working there for 35 years and just retired uh, i joined in 1988 after that it was 25 years before we got women even in the list of applications that is what he is talking about and even these people the women that we have no offense meant these are all people who work in theory we do not have people working in applied sciences dirtying their hands in engineering disciplines at all in the iits even that 8% which you talked about i think it must be 6% or 5% in women three of us women retired this year it brought it down by two percentage points perhaps yeah yeah no i i agree in in fact, yeah in fact pointing out another dimension yeah so no absolutely in fact one but of let me tell you one more thing enrollment if you look at i'm com i come from the computer science and engineering background in many of the uh, college colleges there is even 33% reservation for women this affirmative action now we have a super numerary and so on and so forth but after the btec program how many of them take up post graduation how many of them take up phd the numbers are still very very small i uh, absolutely i agree with uh, the point about the double whammy <clears throat> and the point about the leaky pipeline both the fact that the number of women uh, students actually go down as you move from and you see that not just in gender but in caste as well so i could show the caste uh, leaky pipeline there um and the encatchment point um sure i think uh, i mean for me always the question has been after seeing those numbers is why is it that the pool of applicants is so low um and my sense is that that points towards something and as a journalist i'm interested in understanding that more and more we have some sense we know that there are certain disciplines like uh, you know engineering that like many women are particularly discouraged from going towards so part of the fact that engineering stands at 8% or 9% um women is probably coming from the fact that part of it is definitely discouraging women to even apply for engineering and 
too much okay you need co you, you need you know training ground up we have to train our men yeah. not train the women absolutely <laughs> i totally you know? agree yeah i just want to add uh, that this is uh, the fact that this has been happening year after year after year after year for decades is is uh, it's kind of like a critical point i mean i feel like we should pause everything else and figure out why this is why are i mean i don't know just off the top of my head like uh, i have not really seen any signals from iits that they trying to understand why this is higher sociologists <laughs> may be like have they done studies i must tell you 25 years back when my daughter was born we started the crash and i was told by the then director of iit i asked my wife to stay at home and take care of the kids <laughs> fought like hell and finally but today at least iit madras attracts women because the crash is there hmm. after yeah. you know it's crazy i mean yeah. finally supernumerary has come we've been fighting for it since 90s Yeah. Not now. I mean, with things like the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Awards, yeah. you know, no, no excuse. When I feel like when this is happening two years in a row, three years in a row, then just like cancel the awards till we figure out what is wrong. Of course, with I guess with faculty hiring, you can't cancel the discipline till you figure out what's wrong. But I, I mean, this is not trying to understand the problem. Is I don't think anybody is really um, looking. Not in my understanding. Can I? can i add to this discussion and and really uh, sort of amplify what was said by her that when you present data unless you normalize by numbers number of positions normalized by the number of applicants and i said this to shantan at the tea break you do not get a proper understanding of where the problems are so the absolute numbers are not attractive at all and 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 we totally agree with that but unless you normalize things by the number of applicants by the number of people in science or engineering and in different disciplines you won't be able to analyze the problem well this i is, think this institutes also I have, to have a part to play here in making this numbers more available oh, and that's exactly what i said to yeah. him it's hard I mean, to get right the data i mean right even to yeah. get something as simple as uh, trying to find out from iisc what is the percentage of women in their faculty i have been writing email after email being asked to email the director for this and just receiving no response so then how do we i mean it's so hard for us as journalists already you know not no re under resourced yeah i i just want to say one thing which is that i have finished earlier this year probably the largest investigation of transgender persons access to indian science institutions we filed more than 120 rtis to precisely get this information and more than 50% of our responses have said this data is not available it's mandated by a supreme court judgment <clears throat> and uh, act from the parliament to have this data and i have received none and we are reaching a decade of the nalsa judgment so this data lack of availability is probably the reason why the papers which are by the way not mine um, do not show the normalized data but yeah i really hope one day i'll get those data yeah yeah it's very difficult to get such information the problem is with the data and the analysis and unless you have that you can't draw conclusions i i just want to read this i understand the problem of not getting data no uh, but i think there are several i mean if you leave the data part out we have done as the life of science dot com more than 200 interviews which have pretty unequivocally told us that there are enough ways in which sexism and casteism work in science institutions we do not need numbers to show that numbers demonstrate something with a certain strength fair enough but the the, the large number of interviews that we've done for several projects by now i think we have a very very strong understanding qualitatively that there is no denying sexism and casteism in indian science at at different scales i think there is no denying that in other disciplines in the country uh, from other areas let's say politics or, or the law or, or and so on it is there in one expects a lot from scientists don't we we expect more from someone who says that they are rational it is there in every domain uh, so that is 
because you asked yeah. no, there is yeah, I, I just uh, uh, respond to what uh, Nandita was saying also. I think it's not that people don't know what is the problem of saying this thing of lack of access and uh, or either in terms of caste or gender uh, of the marginalized is been there and everybody knows it. It's like an elephant in the room. Nobody wants to discuss it or approach it. It's institutionalized. I mean, the way the uh, caste system, the structure, the society is set up, it is like that. Unless you break the whole thing and Nobody wants to disturb the system. No, that's the problem because the system is favorable to those who have created it. And obviously they want to get it go. So unless there is a, a groundswell of breaking that happens, it will never change. Any amount of uh, such tinkering will only lead to t uh, small, you know, but there has to be a groundswell change in the societal uh, things and that only will make the change. Last, one last question, anyone? All done? Okay. I hope you, you want to say something? No, I just mentioned. It's there in every domain. Okay. Yeah. Which is so, quite obvious. Yeah. So I hope you all enjoyed uh, the colloquium and uh, more, more of you will take up uh, science journalism in future. Uh, I think there are a couple of formalities now, so we'll go through with that. Thank you, Thank Nandita you. and Shainthan and Narmada. Thank you so much to our panelists. Now we move to our last session of the day. I invite Dr. Jay Asundi to the stage to deliver the concluding remarks. Good evening. Uh, I hope everyone is here because they're really interested in this topic rather than having their attendance marked. Uh, so, uh, we started the day with uh, Sashi talking about obscurantism, but then I think the most important thing that I took away from it was urging to stay, take up science communication. Now, while that was an exhortation to, to begin with, uh, Dr. Dipankar then explained to us why science and society play an integral role, uh, how we could move from magic to science religion, think about all these things, but then the fact that it's important to understand how science progresses and how science actually works. And that was a topic that came up again and again through the entire day. It is very important that the public understand science, and it is the work of the science journalists to be able to translate some of what scientists do in their quote-unquote uh, ivory towers, but also provide them the perspective on why they need to understand, why the public needs to know what is going on, be it improving their lives when it comes to using cell phones. We talked about how delivery can actually go from one person to another if we don't understand the proper application of science, to even maybe providing a person who is not able to have children have children because of science. Uh, Sitabra talked to us about complexity, why things are complex and how emergent property and behavior and how actually what we are doing right now is trying to understand emergent behaviors, especially in science and society. Uh, in the next panel on climate, we had uh, Professor Shankar talk about climate uh, being the, the historical perspective of climate change and how this is not something that has just come up 10 years ago or 20 years ago because uh, we need to figure out how to keep India down and not develop. But the fact that this has been happening over a period of time and we are very clear that the anthropogenic effects of climate change are very clear. Uh, Dr. Anjali talked to us about sustainability, how we can in bring it into our lives and gave us a specific example of you know, renewable energy and how sustainability or circular economy can ado be adopted there. It's a very vast subject and something that needs to be covered across the board. Uh, I think in the afternoon session with Dr. Intumati talking about science, ethics, communication, uh, the key message that I actually took away from that is that we need to focus on the process of 
how science is done rather than the scientist alone. And I think the most important thing there was about critical thinking. How do we use critical thinking to report on a particular topic about a particular subject and get people enthused about science? In the second panel session, uh, I think uh, Nandita, Jairaj, Shantan Datta and Narmada Devi talked about the various aspects related, related to society and how society actually, how the scientific institutions, in my view, are not very different from society at large. They reflect, after all, they are institutions of people and the people come from our society. So the notions of caste, gender, uh, discrimination, uh, essentially knowing, uh, looking at what reality is versus what is depicted in the media and uh, being also being part of certain laboratories in other parts of the world, I can tell you the same happens there too. The media obviously will showcase a laboratory in a far different light than what you see in real. What I really liked about the last talk by Narmada Devi was about the diminishing, uh, diminishing science reporting in media. And I think this is the really the call to action. I think it's very important that we need to start improving or finding more space for science, busting those myths that we have about science and the very fact that science needs to be reported only by the PhD or the person who's trained in science. I, in my view, uh, science reporting can be done by people who have a certain amount of critical thinking, which I would assume all of you here have, and that you're able to communicate in a manner that the common man can understand. It does not need to be in complex language or use jargon that the scientists use. You can translate it or transliterate it or put it together in your own words that other people will look at. So with that, I'm really happy that we were able to conduct this colloquium. Uh, we hope to see more of you uh, getting interest in the topics of science. You need not be scientists to take, a, to take it up. And hopefully we'll have more articles uh, and more space for science in our popular media. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now I'd request Dr. Nalini Rajan, Dean of Studies at Asian College of Journalism to deliver the vote of thanks. <clears throat> so uh, it is rare to come across a colloquium where every single uh, speaker has been outstanding. So we have to thank, I would like to thank right away Dr. Subhashri Desikan for putting it all together for getting the best in the field. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> I would also like to thank our participants, C-STEP and uh, Dr. Banerjee here, Jaya Sundi, Dr. Jaya Sundi, and uh, also Dr. Uh, Anjali Taneja, who's also here from C-STEP. Many thanks for this, you know, for being here and for enriching our experience. Uh, to every single participant, I mean, we've had uh, two outstanding keynote speakers. Uh, uh, we had uh, Dr. Sitamra, Sitabra um, Sena. We also had uh, uh, Dr. Indumati. Outstanding. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, certainly, we also learned a lot from uh, Professor Shankar's uh, contribution uh, from... Um, and also from the last session, especially uh, when we had uh, uh, we had uh, Shoyantan, we had um, uh, Nandita, Jairaj, we also had um, uh, Narmada Devi. Very uh, insightful uh, uh, speeches from all of them, and I'm sure we've learned very much, a lot from everyone here. Uh, so, again, thank you very much for the organizers. We, um, I would also like to thank uh, our um, uh, systems admin. I mean, you know, they've, they've managed to, for us to stay here and keep us uh, going, they, uh, you know, so that you, uh, everything has been rec uh, recorded and we can, you can hear us well. And uh, thank you very much for your contribution. 
the canteen staff who have kept us uh, happy and fed well throughout the whole day. Uh, a very strong thank you to all, of, to all the staff there uh, who've worked doubly hard today. It's been a very hard day and a long day for them. Uh, apart from that, also the housekeeping staff uh, who have also kept the premises very clean. Thanks to them. I would also like to uh, especially thank all the administrative staff because they have, uh, especially Malini, our uh, college administrator, Malini Nathan, and also uh, our Bursar, uh, Lakshmi Ramji. Uh, a, a thank you, a big thank you from all of us to them because I think they've worked very hard behind the scenes for a very long time to uh, make sure that this conference has been a resounding success. So it's been a very long day for uh, everyone. And last but last, uh, not least, the audience. Thank you, all of you, for being here and listening patiently. We have some very distinguished guests among us. We also have our students who've asked uh, very pr uh, intelligent questions. So thank you all. Thank you all very much indeed for being here. Thank you. <laughs>